long live African independence. African unity. Uhuru, and welcome to day two of African Liberation Day Conference led by the African People's Socialist Party. My name is Yejide Oromila. And before we begin the bulk of our program, I want to introduce or bring to you to our program, the Administrative Assistant for Chairman Omali Ishatela and the Maestra of the Uhuru Movement, Elikia Ngoma, who will be introducing the African Nation Fight Song. Comrade Elikia, welcome to the program. Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, President Yejide. Uh, my name is Elikia Ngoma, and I am the Administrative Assistant for Chairman Omali Ishatela, and I will be presenting the African Nation Fight Song. And as I said yesterday, I want to thank uh, the organizers of this program for having this song on, you know, on the agenda. Um, this is a song that came out of the leadership of uh, Chairman Omale Shatela, and with a lot of the text being politically guided by the Secretary General Louise Kinshasa, who is the Secretary General of the African Socialist International. And in short, this song is like African internationalism theory in very short and simple form so that anybody can get it, even if they're hearing the theory for the first time. It reminds us that the African nation is one nation, that we are engaged in the struggle for revolution, and that our goal is for socialism uh, in, our, in our lifetime as well. It raises up you know, past leaders like Marcus Garvey, Patrice Lumumba, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, um, and a quote that he introduced to the struggle of the revolution that was won in Haiti that says, which means cut heads, burn houses. It raises up the red, black, and green. It raises up the need of African workers uh, to overthrow parasitic capitalism. Um, and it does so in a very friendly kind of way. Um, so on your screen is actually a demo version of this song that has the lyrics and um, a demo instrumental um, and melody that you can familiarize yourself with you know how the song goes as you're reading the text at the same time Uhuru.
remember our struggle always be true we are winning from harlem to brazil to azania we are winning we fight and live African Nation fight song. If you do not know the lyrics to that, then that was always helpful. <laughs> and we are so thankful for Maestra Alike and Goma for leading that process, for creating this song and giving African people uh, a national anthem, so to speak, for us to express, you know, our desire to be free and independent African people. And for us in the party, free, independent, under the leadership of the African working class and fighting for a free and liberated Africa. So thank you so much, Comrade uh, Alikia, for uh, the African Nation Fight Song and for really contributing your skills to the African revolution through that process. So next, I want to uh, have an opportunity to bring forth our chairman of the African People's Socialist Party and leader of the African revolution to introduce today's African Liberation Day program. This comrade uh, chairman has been so impactful to the lives of so many African people around the world. And African Liberation Day is a time where we express uh, our desire, not all, always express our desire for the liberation of African people. So Chairman Omali Shetela, please welcome to the program and provide a welcome and opening for today's uh, program. Thank you, comrade. Uhuru, I wanna thank you very much, comrade uh, Yejide, President Yejide Orunila. Uh, for that introduction. And I want to express my appreciation to the African Liberation Day Coordinating Committee that pulled all of this together to make it possible for African people to come together and discuss this question of the liberation of our people. As you know, African Liberation Day was officially something that uh, was, uh, was determined uh, to, uh, to be in existence. It, it was created in 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And uh, on, on, uh, on, this, on May uh, 25th, African Liberation, uh, the Organization of African Unity was founded. And uh, at the founding uh, of this uh, organization, uh, uh, it was determined that uh, Af this would be characterized as African Liberation Day. And uh, for a long time, uh, people were really excited about this. I was one of them. I, uh, I participated in the first African Liberation Day uh, mobilization that happened in the world. And this was only in 1972, uh, after someone who was active uh, in the struggle of African people in this country had gone uh, to Mozambique and had uh, 
uh, gone uh, and participated in the bush with the revolutionaries who were fighting there. And uh, after asking what he could do, uh, and Africans should do uh, uh, in the United States, uh, was advised that we could uh, go ahead and 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 uh, organize African Liberation Day. And this African Liberation Day, as he characterized it, would be something. Uh, that would uh, uh, be in support of the national liberation struggles or the struggles of African people uh, still living under colonial domination in Africa, under Portuguese colonialism uh, in particular, under the colonial domination uh, in, in uh, 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 what was characterized as Rhodesia and South Africa, et cetera. And that part of what we would do uh, was, is to create an African Liberation Day that would bring uh, attention to African people uh, of this, of what was happening to us, and raise funds for the revolutionary movement for those struggles against uh, uh, direct colonialism there, and uh, that's what we organized to do. And what we did not understand is that the African, the organization of African unity that was founded in in uh, Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, uh, in 1963 uh, was something that was done uh, to frustrate the efforts by Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who was the first president of independent Ghana uh, and who had spent uh, much of his life and would spend all of his life trying to really bring unity uh, to the struggle of African people for our total liberation, for the destruction of the borders that separated Africans from each other and from our resources and that uh, the imperialist powers themselves had promoted this, this, this event to create the organization of African unity. You should Google uh, the presentation that uh, Kwame Nkrumah made uh, at this uh, founding uh, uh, convention or conference of the, uh, that created the organization of African unity. His presentation was made on May 24th, and uh, he told everybody there that the outcome of this uh, meeting had to be the, the creation of an actual uh, organization of African unity that destroyed all the borders that separated Africans from each other and created a single uh, uh, united uh, African state. And uh, uh, of course that did not happen. And, and many people who uh, betrayed uh, that effort and Nkrumah had declared that it would be a betrayal to our people who are suffering. And if we don't do this, what will uh, happen is neo-colonialism, this indirect rule, this black power, uh, this white power in black face will dominate uh, Africa and we will catch hell uh, uh, forever. And uh, so Nkrumah did not win that struggle. And they did uh, create this organization of African unity that did not only uh, disregard what Nkrumah had said, but actually codified uh, the illegitimate borders declaring that uh, the borders that were created by white power, that by the colonizers that separated Africa from each other and that separated Africa, Africans from our resources uh, would be inviolate, that they would, they would uh, be there and that it would violate the unity of African people to do anything to destroy the colonial borders. These borders, as you know, uh, were created in 1884 and 85 in Berlin, Germany by white men who sat down at a table and carved up Africa and gave it to each other, uh, like some group of uh, what might be characterized as mafia bosses. Uh, and so uh, that locked Africa into this deadly uh, process. And what it did was to provide uh, now not just uh, individual neo-colonial governments, uh, individual uh, uh, white power governments and blackface in various places. It it uh, dropped an umbrella of neocolonialism over the continent of Africa, and this was uh, uh, something that has uh, resulted in devastation and and murder and brutality and starvation and poverty uh, for since that time. This has been one of the things. This is the the complicity of the African petty bourgeois neocolonial forces in the oppression of our people. And they did it in the name of unifying uh, Africa. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's what's the, that was the consequence. But they, our enemies were still afraid of Nkrumah because uh, uh, everything that he said uh, was coming to fruition, was being made true. So uh, the, even though Nkrumah made this presentation in 1963, the US government uh, led this effort uh, and overthrew Nkrumah in Ghana in 1966. And he was to be killed, murdered, uh, uh, sometimes after that by some kind of mysterious disease. So the fact is that the organization of African unity that, de that declared 
May 25th to be African Liberation Day uh, was something that was founded uh, uh, in an attack on actual unity of African people, one, two. Uh, it also has something that we have come to understand as the African People's Socialist Party is that uh, uh, this unity, uh, unification of Africa and African people will not be made by heads of state. Uh, it's going to have to be coming from the African working class and poor peasantry uh, who really have nothing to lose uh, and who the heads of state, as Nkrumah predicted, uh, 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 find themselves locked into a situation where they only they 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 perpetuate themselves uh, through uh, these existing borders. These uh, false borders that have been created to separate Africa allows for there to be 54 different African presidents or prime ministers and 54 different heads of armies and 54 different uh, 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 governmental entities that allows uh, uh, African people to preen and. Uh, African leaders to and pretend to have power when in fact we have no power. All the power still resides in the hands of the ruling class. So uh, our party, the African People's Socialist Party, uh, was founded on the day of the first African Liberation Day uh, in, in 1972 that was held uh, in the United States. And uh, the fact is that uh, from its inception, we understood our responsibility was to complete the Black Revolution of the 1960s that had already seen the assassination, or that would see, uh, uh, certainly, uh, the, uh, had already seen the assassinations of Malcolm and Martin Luther King and, and Fred Hampton and war being made uh, against the revolution inside the United States and uh, the overthrow and murder of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Lumumba and Nkrumah. And uh, uh, the, this is what contextualized the struggles that we uh, uh, were engaged in and that the party, African People's Socialist Party upon our founding uh, had determined that we were going to complete this revolutionary effort that black people were and oppressed people were making around the world. Uh, so uh, 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 we have been engaged since that time. Uh, we have uh, or come to understand long time ago that the African revolution when fought within the context of those borders that were created by white power for us um, was a losing proposition, that they had run in uh, to their limitations, that there was not going to be uh, any uh, black freedom in the United States. There was not going to be another civil rights movement of any significance or anything like that. There's not going to be uh, some uh, 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 liberation of our people because we declare Black Lives Matter. There was not going to be uh, any uh, independence or freedom of African people in any particular place in the world. Uh, uh, when we fight uh, in these borders that the, that white power has created for us, that how it had to happen is something that Marcus Garvey had recognized a long time ago, that we had to build a single revolutionary organization crossing the planet, where revolution, where African people uh, would strike out to take back our freedom as a whole people, not as Nigerians uh, 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 that uh, didn't get created until 1963, not as, uh, as a black Brits or, or, or uh, some other entity that has been created by white power and that has bestowed an, uh, some kind of false national identity on us as a people that we are one African people and one nation and we're gonna have to fight and win our freedom as one people. And we're talking about a time where revolution was strong uh, in the world despite the fact that the black revolution of the 60s had been created. The people of Vietnam was in, were engaged in serious struggle and teaching many, many lessons about what it takes uh, to be free. And today when we are having uh, this African Liberation Day uh, uh, a process, uh, when we are talking about African Liberation Day under the theme of build uh, the African worker state, uh, we do it at another time of serious crisis for the imperialist social system where peoples all around the world uh, have again, again begun to rise up and where uh, people in Palestine, people uh, in Iran, people in Iraq, people in Afghanistan, people throughout the Americas, Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, uh, et cetera, uh, engage in life and death struggles against the social system and driving it into a deeper and deeper state. Of, uh, of crisis, so much crisis that uh, there's fighting that's going on even among the white powers themselves. Uh, that the, you saw this initially with the, uh, uh, the, the, the Bush regime, uh, the George uh, uh, Bush who came to power and total disregard and having nothing but disdain for 
uh, uh, white power allies uh, uh, in Europe. And it, it's going to be America's way or the highway. And then, of course, uh, after Bush, uh, we saw uh, other presidents who of the United States who sometimes took different tacks, but certainly not Trump. Trump didn't take a different tack. And uh, he uh, has decided that America is going to rule the world uh, and going to continue to rule the world. Uh, and uh, he has acted in that fashion. And so we've seen these struggles of peoples around the world and we've seen the British and we've seen the French and we've seen other people having to make uh, decisions independent of what uh, sometimes uh, in contrary to what the United States wanted them to make. And now the struggle is deep into such uh, an extent uh, that the United States has been fighting the people of Afghanistan, poor people who uh, barely have enough resources to get bread for their children and has been incapable of defeating that people, defeating that country. We've seen the emergence of other forces that's challenged the United States uh, uh, and, and clearly uh, shown that the United States is not the power that it's supposed to be, uh, was thought to be. We've seen Iran uh, being able to stand up against the United States. We've seen Russia uh, uh, re-energized and coming into this process and challenging the United States and Syria and challenging uh, the United States and other places of the Middle East. We've seen China, uh, this behemoth uh, intruding into what uh, officially and uh, normally and, and traditionally have been the sphere of influence and dominance by the US uh, uh, government and by Western white imperialism altogether. So the whole world has been shaken. And uh, this is an extraordinary point in time. And, and we are prepared for that in the African People's Socialist Party. And this discussion we are having today, this event that we are having today uh, around African Liberation Day from our perspective is one method by which we contribute to developing the revolutionary project because Africa will never, ever, ever be free without overturning this relationship that we have with imperialist white power. And that is either directly or indirectly, directly in terms of the United States or France, uh, particularly uh, dominating sectors of our Africa, indirectly in terms of the neo-colonial puppet regimes, government uh, that govern uh, in, the, in, in, in the interests of uh, imperialist white power, uh, and increasingly other forces who are intruding into spaces of Africa, and where it's perceived now that Africa has no interests of our own. Uh, that the future of African people is, it, is being something perceived as something that would be determined uh, by either the United States or by China or some force like that. And we are saying that Africa has to be free, that Garvey had the exact right slogan, Africa for Africans at home and abroad. And so we built an international African revolutionary organization, uh, the African People's Socialist Party, uh, characterized internationally as the African Socialist International where every place African people are located on the planet Earth. Uh, we are trying to win them and are organizing them uh, through, uh, throughout uh, to become part of a revolutionary organization uh, so that wherever we are, we can actually engage in a, a fight uh, to take power. And that's what it's about, because if we're not talking about power, it's nothing but an empty discussion that has no significance at all. So the objective has to be power but not just any kind of power, power in the hands of the African working class. The working class has to be organized uh, uh, under its own leadership. And that's what the African People's Socialist Party is. It is the advanced detachment of the African working class. It is that entity that will provide uh, the leadership for masses of African people to take our power for ourselves so that Africa can have a future, so that African people can have a future, so that we can live, so that the resources of Africa uh, can be in the possession of African people again. And what we see happening in the world validates everything that we understand about what makes this uh, world functions the way it does. And that, of course, has been the colonial attack on Africa that, that created this system in the first place. This is what uh, uh, the Marx referred to as the basis for the foundation of capitalism. And he said that uh, capitalism was begun by turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. He talked about how capitalism was a consequence of the war that was made against China by England that turned China into a country of junkies. Uh, we talked about how Vietnam uh, was also uh, uh, a, a dope den uh, for, for French imperialism, how most of the resources coming from uh, from Vietnam, our French colonizers came uh, in the form of drugs and things like that. 
all around the world, white power has dominated the world through extracting value, stealing our resources, killing and murdering and raping and pillage. So what we see that's happening in the day today uh, in places like, 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 like Venezuela and places where the United States is murdering people in Afghanistan, et cetera, this is not new. This is how the whole system started. Even the existence of the United States is, uh, uh, as a settler colony. Uh, as we know, colonialism is something that traditionally where white people have come, uh, the imperialists have come, the colonizers have come, and they've stolen, uh, they, they've attacked our land, and they've sent their resources back to what they call the mother country. They came from England, and they, they attacked indigenous people in the Americas, and they captured African people and dragged us here. And then they would have us working uh, like beasts, and then they would send the resources that they were getting here uh, in this land and send it back to England. They did the same thing all over the world. Uh, uh, but what happened in the United States and what happened through much of what is called South America and what happened in Australia uh, and New Zealand, uh, particularly in some of these places, the, the white colonizers settled there. They didn't just send resources back, they stayed. And in the United States, they actually got in a fight. They had a war that they called independence with the with what was called the mother country with England to keep all of it for themselves. And this is a settler colony where, where the people who have taken this land are not indigenous to this land. The people who are indigenous to this land are in concentration camps that they call Indian reservations. And this land, the resources, the development, the, the work to production the, created the actual uh, ec economy of this was done by African people at the point of a gun. And so this is a settler colony. And, and the whole colonial global system is based on colonialism. Based, it, was, it was colonial loot resources that made Europe rich, uh, that created what they call the industrial revolution that's responsible for everything that is got. And so uh, now the peoples around the world are fighting back and it's an incredibly important time. And it's a critical moment for the African revolution as well. In order for the African revolution to succeed, then we have to recognize that revolution is necessary, that there's not going to be some kind of exceptional for exception for black people, for African people. We're gonna to have to fight to get our freedom. We're gonna to have to take total liberation of our people. We're gonna to have to create the kind of organization designed uh, to do that. We're gonna to have to create the kind of membership of those organizations that's committed to doing everything that's necessary to winning our freedom. Uh, we're going to have to create a long view. We have a long view. And this long view is consolidated in our theory of African internationalism that shows how the entire world economy revolves around this colonial looting that uh, continues up to now. This is where capitalism comes from, which is why we call it colonial capitalism. This is the capitalism that Marx could not identify and, and particularly could not understand. He called it primitive accumulation. But when he talked about primitive accumulation, what happened to Africans? What happened to other peoples around the world? But he spoke of it uh, only as something that was significant to the development of Europe. What we are saying is colonialism happened to us. It is this what Marx called primitive accumulation. That is the startup of all capitalism was colonialism. And what we are saying is that the struggle against colonialism is what is going to change the world when we are victorious and the critical element in this struggle against colonialism is the African Revolution. And the African Revolution will be a, will be a magnificent global revolution that will be able to unite uh, all of the anti-colonial struggles of the world from Palestine to South, to what they call South America, uh, even to uh, 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 St. Louis, uh, Missouri, and the United States and various other places. So this is why we are here. We are here to build this revolutionary project. We are putting revolution down every place and we've built all kinds of organizations. We've built organizations that open the door for masses of people to become involved in the struggle as women, uh, in the struggle as uh, workers, in the struggle uh, as people who want to deal with the environment, as in the struggle uh, uh, on every front as that's possible. The African People's Socialist Party has done that. And one of the most critical things that we've done is we've created an organization under our leadership or a part of our organization, uh, a, a, a solidarity front of colonizers uh, in, in various cities in almost every state inside the United States. Uh, we have these colonized white people who work uh, in solidarity under the leadership of the African revolution, taking the revolution to the into the communities and homes of the colonizers themselves, not only in the United States, but in eight other countries uh, around the world. This is what we have done. 
And so we call on you to come to this meeting today with the objective of uh, actually fighting for power and recognizing that this African Liberation Day mobilization is something that is to carry out the mission that Nkrumah started some time ago. And that is to unify Africa, but to unify Africa, the only way it can be uni unified is under the leadership of the African working class that now has its own organization uh, that now uh, is able to establish tactics and strategies to make that happen, that now has various kinds of institutions that's been created to establish an independent uh, economic uh, anti-colonial economy that now recognizes uh, that imperialism itself, white power is in a state of crisis and that it is our time to strike out and to take our freedom. It takes a certain kind of membership to do this. It takes a certain kind of discipline to do this. It takes a commitment to actual strategy and tactics and not just something you do because you feel angry at any given moment, but uh, revolution we recognize as a process and it is not an event. And this process is one that the African People's Socialist Party has been leading now uh, for more than 50 years. And we've come to a place where we are now where victory is in sight, in, in sight. And we can, we can see it, we can taste it, we can feel it. And so we just want to call on all of you here uh, to unite uh, with what it is that we are providing, join the African Revolution, join the African People's Socialist Party, let's move forward and end the suffering of African and all of the workers and toiling peoples of the world. Uhuru, Uhuru, ease way late to e Africa. Uhuru, Uhuru. Okay, Uhuru, thank you, Chairman, uh, for that very powerful and dynamic overview. Uh, mm -hmm. My name is Lika Ngoma, and I will be your second moderator for today for everybody who is just now tuning in. Um, and I just want to thank the Chairman, uh, Omali Ishatala, for providing that great historical basis behind. African Liberation Day, what it means, and also uh, the role of the African People's Socialist Party in uh, at how we know African Liberation Day today. Yesterday, we received powerful presentations about the party's regional strategy, economic development, and the question of African women, as well as a dynamic keynote presentation by our chairman, Omali Ishatala. Today, we will have more revolutionary content as we make the call for you to join the African People's Socialist Party and sign up to be a part of, of building the African worker state. I have the honor of introducing the next discussion led by Luezi Kinshasa, who is the Secretary General of the African Socialist International and Chairman Omali Ishitela, who just spoke. And they will be discussing the ways that colonialism has changed the entire environment of the planet and how organizing an African worker state will be the first step in overturning this contradiction. Our chairman, Omale Shatala, is the founder of the African People's Socialist Party and leader of the Uhuru movement. From the day he tore down the racist mural from City Hall in St. Petersburg, Florida in 1966, Chairman Omale Shatala has never stopped fighting for liberation for African people everywhere. In the heat of revolutionary struggle and during the years in prison for his political work, Chairman Omali developed the theory of African internationalism that understands the world through the eyes of the African working class. The chairman authored numerous articles, pamphlets, and books, and has led countless campaigns in the name of the African poor and working class. Today, Chairman Omali Ishitela, as the leader of the African Socialist International, speaks to his growing base around the world and leads the worldwide movement for the liberation of Africa and African people everywhere. Comrade Luezi is the Secretary General of the African Socialist International. Born in Congo, he currently lives in exile in London where he presides over the building of the African People's Socialist Party throughout Africa and Europe. S.G. Luezi's regular column in the Burning Spear newspaper analyzes current events and development on the continent of Africa from an African internationalist perspective. He publishes a bilingual version of the Spear in French and English for distribution in Africa and Europe. He is fluent in eight languages and he has traveled, written, and spoken extensively throughout the world 
and is well known and respected in London, especially among the large Congolese activist community there. Welcome, Comrade S.G. Luwezi and Chairman Omali Ishitala. Uhuru. Uh, Comrade Elijah, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I just want to make a correction and in the introduction. Uh, I don't speak eight languages, so I must apologize how uh, this information came through. Um, uh, um, I basically uh, 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 well, speak uh, four languages, uh, but not, uh, not eight. So uh, I just want to correct that, but I appreciate definitely the uh, introduction. And uh, I also just want to say, uh, I want to salute uh, Chairman Omari uh for his uh, historical uh, leadership. Uh, as you, you all heard uh, his uh, presentation just a few minutes ago, everything he does, every presentation yeah, I've seen or I've heard him doing is always a found gap presentation. It's always innovation in everything he does, or always showing the way. And uh, for those of us uh, who never had the, the benefit of knowing uh, what the real leader of African Revolution uh, was like, you know, like the, the Garvey, the Kuma, the Malcolm X, Chairman uh, Omari definitely a concretizer, Ambada is, um, is definitely a, a living example uh, of that. I just want to really recognize that. And I also just want to salute everybody uh, who worked hard to make this uh, uh, if ALD uh, a reality, and also all the presenters yesterday, uh, particularly uh, the presentation of this on yesterday, in uh, showing us uh, how the future looks like, how the economic work looks like. Uh, it was a powerful presentation, so I want to also recognize that. So uh, African Liberation Day uh, is a day definitely uh, of great, greatest importance for us, uh, because as the, the title says itself, it's about our liberation. So it's not just a place we come and uh, consume information, but it's a place why we can learn. I will sum up, but we advance the struggle. And if you have not joined, you join. If you're not doing anything, you become part of the solution has laid out uh, by the body and uh, all the presenters who, will be, who came yesterday and also will be uh, coming today. Uh, today, uh, the title, you know, uh, we couldn't find a better title than that because uh, from last night, we heard that Volcano, in a Goma, in a Kivu a province in the Congo, erupted. And uh, when you look at, at the consequences of the uh, volcano, uh, basically, is a uh, it hit mostly uh, the poor people. It hit uh, the African working class. And it's not by chance that the building of the settlement of the houses for the working class was situated, you know, in that place. The uh, bourgeoisie knew it, the African people bourgeoisie knew it, uh, that that place was a dangerous place to be. Just in the case of any eruption, uh, they would not have any chance, uh, basically. So I still don't know in terms of uh, uh, how many people died or anything like that, but only thing I know from what uh, I learned this morning, uh, all the houses burned, gone. You know, people came back, you know, uh, today to see uh, how the place looks like. Nothing there. Just the working class, you know, just the displaced people uh, from wars, you know, uh, refugees uh, and people like that. So I just want to <clears throat> start from there. Uh, one thing I also want to say, uh, we really have to be just clear, very, very clear. Every time you hear on the TV, uh, on the news, you open the newspapers, uh, you hear the bourgeoisie complaining about the climate change, about the environment. Uh, they say, you know, we, we've got to fix what mankind has done. Uh, we just want to stop uh, from there. We're not talking about mankind. We are talking about white power, colonial white power, being responsible of what's going on on the planet. So they want us to take the responsibility, uh, all of us, collectively, the, the oppressors and the oppressed, you know, Europeans and the Africans, yeah, everybody, you know, is responsible. If you listen to the narrative coming from the borders, you know, you want to say that's not true. It's definitely not uh, the case. Uh, and also, we want to say that uh, the uh, 
humanity has been going on for a long time. Uh, we never heard uh, of a, you know, existential crisis due to the climate changes for humanity. We never heard anything like that. You know, uh, we lived uh, with an environment, uh, we used the environment to get food, whatever you want, uh, understanding the significance of, of the environment, but we never assaulted the environment because the environment, we depended on water. We depended on our, on our the wind, on our plants, all these things. We depended on them, animals, things like that. So we, will, we did not, uh, you know, assault uh, the environment. And, uh, but if you look at the rise of white power based on colonialism, it was an assault on our Africans, indigenous, you know, all the people uh, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia. You heard chairman talking about the French transformed Vietnam to a drug den and things like that. And they also assaulted the environment. So there is no way we can talk about this uh, natural phenomenon uh, without, uh, let's say, we can't talk about this natural uh, phenomenon outside of our colonialism. It's not, it's, not, it's not possible. And it's not possible for a simple reason. When you look at uh, hurricanes, uh, uh, you know, earthquakes uh, and things like that, they're supposed to be natural phenomenon. But what's happening now, you can't characterize them just natural phenomenon anymore. You can you better say colonial hurricanes, colonial earthquakes, for the simple reason that when we used to experience, when the world used to experience uh, natural you know, storms and uh, hurricanes and uh, all this kind of phenomenon, it was a never an existential threat to humans, to a species in the forest, in the water, you know, there was no anything like that. Every time there was a storm, then there will be, a, you know, a, a, an existential crisis uh, for uh, fish and the things like that. It didn't exist. But now what we do have is a threat, not just to the survival of humanity, but a threat to species in the water, in the forest. And if you look at the, uh, at the uh, statistics uh, regarding basically uh, what's happening uh, to the uh, uh, humanity, you won't believe it. About 200 species go extinct every day. According to the UN Environment Program, the Earth is in the midst of a mass extinction of life. Scientists estimate that 150 to 200 species of plants, insects, birds, and mammals become extinct every 24 hours. This is nearly 1,000 times the natural or background rate, and, and uh, some biologists say it's, great, it's greater than anything the world has experienced since the vanishing of the dinosaurs nearly 60 million years ago. Can you imagine that? 200 species go extinct every day. So, bef you know, the, the uh, LD study yesterday, so by today, 400 species will have gone extinct. That's colonialism. That's not just, you know, man uh, in general or humankind in general. This is colonialism. These are uh, 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 white power. That is the white ruling class and the colonial white society uh, that has attacked everything that exists on the planet. Just, you know, everything has to come to you. Everything has to go to white people. They will consume everything, you know, Everything has to go to enrich uh, the, uh, the white colonial society. And uh, no regard for the long term, for the long term conse consequences. Uh, and uh, they, you have all these, uh, you know, uh, colonizers who talk about environment. They don't talk about uh, the colonial enslavement of Africans as an attack on environment. Because an attack on humans, that's the first attack on the environment. They don't, they don't mention that. Indigenous Americas, you're almost in the United States extinct, you know, almost gone. You know, the uh, handful left the uh, constitution camps they call reservation. They don't define that as uh, an environmental crisis. 
And uh, you go realize that Africa didn't, we didn't have syphilis. We didn't have even cholera in Africa. And when you say that, you know, it's like a surprise to many people. Yeah, we didn't have all those things. And uh, when they're saying, you know, there is an environmental crisis, they're not talking about that. They're talking about a uh, green economy, green capitalist economy, making uh, the economy uh, uh, more efficient, in more, making capitalism more efficient. Instead of having all this production that produce so much CO2, uh, you know, uh, all these uh, carbon uh, gases and things like that, they want to produce uh, in a way that Europe should not be polluted, at least white people, they should experience life without pollution. If there's a pollution, send it back to Africa, send it to India, send it to other places, but they won't experience uh, green capitalism. And that is impossible. That's not possible. There is no such thing as green economy or green uh, environment outside of context of colonialism. We cannot remove colonialism from everything they say, from everything they want to do. Because if you want to solve this question, of environment, we must eradicate colonialism. We must destroy colonialism. And uh, you will know one of the reasons uh, 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 we're saying that, just look at every time there is uh, an environmental uh, crisis or there is uh, uh, a disaster uh, uh, in Africa. Uh, yeah, I'm not really yet speaking to those pictures, but I appreciate the comment doing that. That's really important as it reminds me that, uh, I, no, it's good, it's good, it's good. Just, just leave them there. It just uh, reminds me that uh, uh, some comments had to be made because people have seen those pictures. So I might just say a few things about it before I carry on. You've seen those pictures, uh, particularly like the one you're watching now. Uh, these everyday environments in Africa, that's everyday. You go to Nigeria, you go to Ghana, Sierra Leone, wherever you go, that's an everyday environment. And this is colonial environment. This is our biological warfare against the people. This is infestation, uh, you know, the communities infested with mosquitoes, you name it. Everything comes uh, in this type of, of uh, environment. And the, this is the norm. And this, this basically speaks of colonialism being the norm. Uh, for the life of African people. And this just constantly did, verifies the theory of African internationalism that the foundation of fascist capitalism is colonialism. That's what we experience. Colonizers don't experience that. White people don't live like this, but we live like this. We live all this water uh, with us, and mosquitoes, all kind of insects uh, will be uh, uh, with us. And we need to know that uh, there is no production there is no production under fascist capitalism, basically produced by colonialism, that does not destroy the environment and African lives. It does not exist. Every production, every colonial production comes with destruction of environment, destruction of African lives, every single one. Uh, from colonial enslavement to at this very moment, there is no production that give life to capitalism and does not take lives from Africans, does not attack the environment, does not attack the people. It does not exist. Uh, if you you take like uh, uh, South Africa, Johannesburg, is a uh, builds in a mineral uh, uh, zone. That's where all kind of minerals are extracted. Uh, you name it, gold, uh, you know, uh, cadmium, everything is there. But the consequence of it is that people are, have got TB. They are impacted by uh, all kind of uh, heavy metals. Uh, all the, uh, you know, shanty uh, towns, they have built all these uh, uh, settlements they have built around the mines, they are also dumping sites. They are contaminated dumping sites, and uh, we have birth defects. Uh, we have all kinds of problems. I'll take an example of Johannesburg, just one. Uh, if we move the slide, there might be another uh, picture. Uh, this one, for example, this is in Zambia. 
these in a cup way. This way they produce uh, copper and uh, lead, things like that. In fact, these children, they play on a dumping site, on a lead dumping site. It means that these children, these African children you see right now, they have lead in the blood, in the bodies. And, uh, and this is true. You go realize Africa is full of mines. Every single mine has dumping sites. And uh, all these dumping sites, we live in the side by side. So it means that all of us there, we have cadmium in our blood, arsenic on our blood, uranium on our blood, lead on our blood, you name it. Of course, the African neocolonialists don't care. You know, that's no part of the uh, of the job to, you know, to organize and fight for people. They are there to maintain such a school. So that's not really a problem for them. So this is just one example. And there are many, when I say many, they are countless. Wherever we leave the working class reside in Africa, we are living side by side with poison, with a poison environment. And this is colonialism. And that's what we're saying all along. When we have mudslides, when we have hurricanes, the problem is not that we have mudslides, that we have hurricanes. The problem is imperialism, because it's imperialism that denies us the access to resources to rebuild our lives after the mudslide or to rebuild our lives after health course, like in Haiti. We can have to rebuild our life quickly, but imperialism prevents us from doing that. Uh, Bill Clinton and his family stole the money, so we cannot rebuild our lives. And uh, all these multinational companies, they stole our wealth every day, so we are remain powerless. See, so if you talk about solving the crisis of environment, First of all, you go recognize that we must have black power. That's the starting point. The people must have power. When you go power, then we can first change the economy because black power cannot coexist with colonialism. Colonialism has to go. And when we go power, then we can decide where we live, how the water is treated, what we're going to produce, what kind of uh, uh, minerals uh, we need, and, and so on. But under colonialism is the white ruling class uh, with their uh, partners in crime or accomplices of African people with Brazil, uh, we decide what we produce, uh, where the masses uh, uh, reside, and what we consume, uh, how things are produced, and things like that. So you can move uh, on next slide, please. Of course. These are uh, deforestation. This is the camera. And you know, they're talking about the greenhouse effect that you need the forest to capture uh, uh, the CO2, uh, your, all these gases are being uh, released. Uh, so if you remove the, the forest, if you cut all these trees, you're contributing to the crisis of the environment. And this capitalism, and we know cutting these trees because we want to build houses for the African people. No. This to send wood to Europe and also to transform this place to agriculture for uh, capitalist production so we can produce uh, commercial crop, you know, cocoa or soya or stuff like that. So the uh, very essence of the contradiction between colonialism and environment is right there. Colonialism is a contradiction with the environment because it's designed to attack the people, to attack Africa, to attack colonized people, and to attack the environment itself. Uh, so that's why basically it has to go. And this, of course, will benefit this US company, United States Aerocos oil, oil Company. So if we move to the next slide, yeah, these are uh, a similar one. So it's the same company. Uh, these you can see uh, the agricultural production. Uh, the next one was an example of a fish. Uh, these basically, in, in the rivers, uh, somewhere in South Africa, they dump so much toxic uh, in water. After 130 years of gold extraction in South Africa, the fish even are contaminated. You can see, uh, you know, this is just uh, an example of it. And these, if you take Nigeria, you, you will see the same thing, oil, a shell from Britain and Holland, they, they contaminate our rivers, uh, our, our, water table, uh, so large area uh, in Nigeria, they can't grow food anymore, people can't go fish anymore because they attack the environment, they destroy their environment, and uh, that's just to produce oil uh, for Britain and for 
uh, Holland. Uh, so that's that's a kind of colonial uh, uh, colonialism basically uh, uh, works. If we can take the next slide. Yeah, these uh, African workers looking for gold and uh, you will know it means that the water you see over there, it's already contaminated because you have to use mercury and uh, other substance just to, you know, to extract uh, 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 this gold. And you have to know that uh, depending where you are, in some places to have like maybe two or teaspoon of gold, uh, you need to extract something between like uh, 500 kilogram to one ton of waste. It just gives you an idea of pollution. Generally speaking, people have no idea uh, what min uh, mining means. All the, all the mineral extraction, all of them, with no exception, you have to contaminate, not just the water, but you have to change the balancing that exists uh, in the system, in a, in a ecosystem, basically, because you have to open up uh, the earth, you go change the equilibrium, the balance that was sitting there for million, if not billion of years. You go take new substance that was safely buried under the earth, take them out. And by doing that, you're breaking the balance of the earth. In fact, if when you look at the initialization itself of the earth, is a, a qualitative transformation, which is also a, uh, a definitely a break in the balance between uh, production uh, and uh, the ecosystem, because some scientists said it is uh, from 1750 that uh, the, um, at the beginning of the uh, industrialization that the climate change started. And that's not by accident, because the Industrial Revolution definitely is a new uh, uh, technology that is sending in the atmosphere, all kind of toxics, all kind of polluted uh, substances. And what you're looking at today is a cumulative effect, a cumulative you know, consequence. It's not just one year, two years. You're looking at like 600 years of assault on Africa. When you see the consequences of African lives, African culture, the way uh, we are today, you're looking at a cumulative impact. The same way when you look at the net, at the uh, ecosystem, at the environment, you are looking at a cumulative effect. 600 years of aggression of the planet. That's what you're looking at. And uh, so what you see in these pictures is just uh, you know, one aspect of it. Uh, next slide, please. Of course. Uh, you go remember these the African workers, particularly African women here, you can see uh, in Ghana, uh, and all this has happened, you know, they refer to, the bourgeoisie refers to African working like that, uh, artisanal production, which means it's not done by intensive capital, by machinery, things like that. So they say artisanal. And you have to realize, usually they say, and you know the bourgeoisie lies a lot all the time, they say 30% of the mineral production is artisanal, which means we do it by bare hands. Like you see these sisters, they are, those workers, they produce the same way for coltan, cobalt, 30% by hand. And it means that the environment here, there is no protection for them. Whatever bacteria is sitting in this muddy water, they will have it. Uh, whatever toxin they need to use, uh, they will have in the bodies. It will be in the rivers. It will, I mean, and you're talking about of extraction, transportation of these minerals. They use lorries. And uh, so basically, there is a release in the atmosphere of all kinds of minerals, all kinds of heavy metal, all kinds of toxics, and we live with that throughout uh, Africa uh, and uh, wherever Africans are, are colonized. So all the rivers in Africa, generally speaking, most of them are contaminated. So if we take next one. And of course, you can see that's, that's colonialism, that's daily lives, that's the norms in Africa. All the dust in, is in your lungs. You're absorbing all this every day. That's not what the uh, colonizers are talking about when they met in Paris in 2015 to discuss uh, the environment, what needs to be done. They're not talking about that. They're talking how to make, I don't say, uh, capitalist economy more efficient, 
uh, by definitely uh, making sure that whatever European consume, they consume it, uh, it's safe for them and Europe is less polluted and, and things like that. Uh, this is uh, somewhere in Nigeria. Uh, next one. Of course, that's a working class. Because we have to approach the question of environment. The starting point is the African nation, but it's the African working class. And uh, the struggle of the African working class, of course, is to seize power so we can overturn the practice of imperialism, which means that colonialism has to go so that we can be in environments that does not keep us to live 24 7 in the polluted areas. How can you live in this environment? But this is how we produce life for capitalists. That's how we do it. We live in this environment. Uh, so, uh, next one, I think. Yeah, of course, this is a working class environment. Uh, uh, next one. Of course, this production, uh, these are uh, uh, the, all these youngsters, you've got content in those bags, you know, that goes to make mobile phones, you name it, uh, any high sophisticated uh, gadget we use today uh, requires the content. And these are the African workers, uh, these are the children, they are part of what they refer to as artisanal. Uh, workers, so the children who don't work in uh, by the intensive uh, with intensive capital, they don't use machinery, everything by hand. You know, we use uh, you know, uh, we carry things ourselves, no machinery. You know, uh, yeah. And you can see the environment, uh, the water, muddy water, infected mosquitoes, flies, you name it. Yeah. The next one. These are workers, overcrowded housing. You know, uh, when uh, the colonizers live in uh, big houses, you know, with electricity, you name it, you know, you, but we live like that, you know. And then, of course, uh, no clean hair, you know, you know, and TB will be, in fact, amongst the workers working in the mines, TB is, is a serious problem from South Africa to Congo uh, to Ghana, Nigeria, TB is there, you know. The next one. Yeah, of course, colonialism introduced diseases throughout uh, the colonies uh, because the struggle against the, uh, the struggle for green economy or green deal, uh, you know, they, they, even what Joe Biden's talking about, the green new deal, they're not talking about war against tuberculosis or diabetes or uh, chronic liver diseases, epilepsy, uh, cerebral palsy. All these things are consequences of colonialism, aggression on the African nation, on the African people. Uh, and that's basically the significance of uh, African internationalism, that we are, we are the ones saying the starting point is colonialism. No discussion on a new Green Deal or whatever that is they want to uh, uh, bring to us if we don't put colonialism in the center. Everything's a consequence of colonialism. From storms, a hurricane, and HIV, AIDS, a you name it, malaria, everything is a consequence uh, of that. So the struggle uh, for, for a green economy, for a clean environment, is definitely a struggle against colonialism. I think this could be the, this is probably the last one. Can you see if it, what's the next one? Then I can stop. Yeah, that was the last one. So. There are a lot of things uh, to be said. This is a, a huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, field basically uh, for African internationalism. I'm glad that uh, we are getting uh, into this, but I just want to conclude by saying we already say we need black power as a solution, and this way up there with the black, uh, the black Ankh project becomes significant because it's here where we can begin to mobilize African workers. Uh, win African scientists uh, to African internationalism so we can have our own rescue operations so we can be prepared because colonialism is with us so we should not wait for the next hurricane or storm but we can be prepared uh, so we can intervene in the process of winning people to our own solutions but also winning everybody um, in African uh, our world and our, all our um, colonized people and also uh, taking the struggle inside uh, the colonizer uh, nation uh, that uh, the new world, uh, we need to build, we need to criticize white scientists because they are colonizer scientists. They are responsible for also in contributing and developing uh, the science that works against humanity that con contribute to all these climate change, global warming, and so on. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank again the uh, 
uh, the comrades in uh, organizing the LD, uh, you know, giving me the opportunity just to to be part of this uh, uh, discussion on our colonialism versus the environment. Destroy colonialism, bring on black power, or Uhuru. I want to uh, thank Comrade uh, Secretary General Luese for that presentation. And I too uh, want to join with him in saluting uh, the organizers of this African Liberation Day event, uh, giving us an opportunity to discuss this question uh, of the environment um, in a way that's meaningful. And that's really important right now because as we see, uh, the colonial powers of the world have discovered the environment and they talk about the threat to the environment and they call themselves environmentalists and they uh, put forth uh, suggestions about how to deal with this problem. But as Comrade Secretary General Luese has already pointed out, uh, the question of the environment uh, is something that is uh, a consequence of uh, the, the threat to the environment is a consequence of colonialism. And, and there's no way you can get around it. Some people don't understand what we mean when we talk about uh, a global economy. Uh, that when we look at the colonial uh, capitalism, it's what we're talking about. It's a social system, it's a whole global economy that uh, white people like to refer to it as market-driven economy. And which means simply that everything is produced for sale. That people produce, uh, that in, in this kind of economy, stuff get produced not because of uh, necessarily simply because somebody needs it, it gets produced in order to sell it. And this is a driving force throughout the world. And where, how does this get started? It gets started with colonialism because when we first met white people, uh, 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 they were hungry, they were starving, they were diseased, they lived under a most oppressive system that they, they call feudalism. Uh, where the majority of the people were tied to the land. Uh, they weren't uh, exactly slaves, but uh, they were not free to move, uh, to go any place. And part of what they earned, part of what they produced, uh, that was taken by the landlords, by the nobility. They took that for themselves. And so you had the majority of white people living in, under this thing that they call feudalism. That was throughout Europe. This was a European phenomenon that I'm talking about right now. And then in, in three years, uh, 1347, 1351, something like that, uh, four years, uh, uh, half the white people on earth died. They died from plague. And uh, uh, it, it was an extraordinary event that made so many changes throughout Europe. But uh, you had for a hundred years or so, uh, the, the intensification, the, 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 that plague uh, coming back and, and uh, just decimating much of Europe. And Europe uh, rescued itself uh, through uh, 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 what we now know as the slave trade. It was uh, uh, where some Europeans, were, and, and please, I'm not talking about some conspiracy where all the white people got together and say, let's go uh, and capture African people. I'm saying that uh, what we saw emerge was uh, 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 Europeans, some Europeans who did leave Europe and they, uh, they uh, initiated, uh, 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 attacks on Africa and other peoples around the world. And this is where you saw uh, the emergence of what we now call a capitalist system. And, and part of what uh, I think uh, makes this significant in terms of understanding how capitalism functions and what it looks like uh, is that uh, peoples around the world have lived for a long time uh, without having uh, to deal with white people. And uh, they produced for a long time, had decent lives for a long time. In fact, you can't, uh, one of the things that's uh, magnificent and particular and peculiar about Africa and many other, and some other peoples is uh, the level of cultural development. You know, the, the poetry, the dancing, the song and stuff like that. That's something that people recognize as, as African. Uh, you can't do that. You can't have that kind of life uh, if everything, uh, every day, uh, your back is up against the wall and you're just fighting for survival as was in Europe. The fact was that we were able to develop our own humanity because, uh, 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 because our production process and our relationship to nature was, was such that it was possible to even have the time to become poets and dancers and singers and develop that kind of cultural expression, those kinds of cultural expressions uh, and the kind of economy that we had. 
this whole thing that we say uh, uh, that sometimes upset us when we hear Hillary Clinton making you know statements. It takes <laughs> it takes a village to raise a children a child. That's a that's an African expression. And 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 why would you say it takes a village to raise a child? It, it's because it, we live in a collective societies. How can you have a collective society except you have a collective economy? The economy, the economic life of the people was not uh, one person against the other, or uh, a group of people against everybody else. It was a collective economy. It was not an economy based on exploitation, ripping people off, etc. And so that's the kind. It was socialized production, if you will. There was socialized production, just as there's socialized production uh, today, but also it was socialized ownership. So we own things collectively, generally speaking. And that was reflected in our social relationships. That's why, you know, uh, and even you find that uh, even as desperate as things have been made for African, African peoples globally, you will still, still find uh, expressions of this kind of collectivism this, uh, 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 in our culture and, and other things like that. So, so, but Europe was a whole different expression. And this is what they imported to Africa and to much of the other parts of the world. But the other thing that was that's really striking about that is that, uh, the, 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 for example, um, uh, the European found uh, uh, discovered tobacco in the Americas. Indigenous people are using tobacco. I, I, you don't hear any evidence of the indigenous people dying of cancer and stuff like that. They weren't smoking four packs of cigarettes or two packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, it was a whole different relationship that they had with it. It was ceremonial, uh, et cetera, but you become gluttons. If what you get is not something that's produced by your own society and you just go out and grab it and take it from somebody else, it creates a whole gluttonous kind of, of society where uh, uh, you, you do it uh, because it's easy to do, because you didn't produce it, it came from someplace uh, else, and it came from the colonized people. And this is where all these resources come from. And this is where you see the birth of the system that we call capitalism coming out of this process. This is where uh, you had this tremendous amount of wealth coming uh, and thrown into Europe uh, and, and the so-called industrial revolution. All these things happen as a consequence of this accumulation of wealth that was not produced by Europe. It was an accumulation of wealth that came from someplace else. And so you have Europe having all these resources and now they got factories and, and they've got uh, all you know, other kinds of uh, institutions that, that this is where uh, 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 the Europeans like to trace the global warming. But what I'm saying and what we are saying is that that's, that discussion is the wrong narrative. Uh, that how can you not say the environment was under assault when you are attacking Africa and millions? Some people have estimated as many 200 million African people being snatched up out of Africa and then, and, and then uh, 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 dispersed uh, throughout the world. The whole ecosystem of the Atlantic Ocean gets changed because sharks learn how to follow the ships that are leaving Africa and taking African people to other places around the world for dispersal, and many of whom uh, these Africans either jump off because they don't want to leave our Africa or because the colonizer would throw them off because it's more profitable if they got sick or something else. They didn't want the others to get sick because they were going to make money at the end of the journey. So sharks, literally schools of sharks, learn to follow these ships that were leaving Africa. And then when you talk about this assault on Africa, you're talking about uh, 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 that, that, that where there used to be uh, villages and cities and things like that, and they get overgrown because people are running from the slavers uh, and leaving, leaving their farms and leaving their communities, and they get overthrown. In fact, uh, we've seen something that said by 1600, uh, there was a, a little, what they call a little ice age, uh, because of the Europeans had come to what we now know as the Americas and killed something like 56 million. 56 million so-called Indian people. And, and, and during that process, what they did was, uh, it meant that, uh, that their, their, their cities and farms and things like that were overgrown. Now you have a situation where there's too much uh, uh, green. So, so that, uh, uh, that uh, this, the, the, the uh, CO2, what is it, uh, carbon dioxide and what have you, that the, 
the, the, uh, that uh, the vegetation uh, would actually uh, take out of the air and then release oxygen and what have you. It, it, it created a situation that it changed the whole, uh, uh, how, how uh, uh, humans could live. It changed the entire environment. So you had a little ice age, that's about 1600. But, but this is what has happened. And, and of course, by 1415, uh, uh, the assault on Africa begins where they kidnap African people and start this, Portugal in particular, uh, it begins this process of dispersing African people around the world. So this is where you have this major assault. And the reason that they wanna count uh, the, the uh, global warming uh, that begins with uh, 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 1750 uh, and the so-called industrial revolution is because this is uh, where you can begin uh, the development of Europe. And the development of Europe in a particular way coming at the expense of Africa and the rest of the world. Now Europe, Europeans have entered into history in a different way. Uh, and now there's industry that's being developed. But don't make the mistake of thinking that there was no industry in Africa, no industry in other places around the world. That's an absolute total lie. In fact, even the slave trade was informed in, in some instances by strategically going to certain places in Africa to steal Africans with certain skills, with certain capacity that they brought here. I mean, rice growing and other kinds of things like that beyond that. And then we are the ones who were the carpenters. We are the ones who built everything even under this slavery. So this notion of somehow we got introduced to industry, we got introduced uh, uh, to production through uh, uh, slavery is nonsense. Uh, Europeans got introduced to production through slavery. And this process uh, is, is uh, something that I think we should recognize. So, uh, I, and now you see uh, the, the earth is, uh, is challenged. Uh, the life on the planet earth is challenged in a very obvious way. It's been challenged. People are telling us now uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, it's an existential question, the environment. But how can it be an existential question now uh, when uh, uh, for the indigenous people who lost 56 million people by 1600? It wasn't, in, it wasn't existential then. I mean, if you got masses of black people and poor people and oppressed people around the world dying uh, uh, from living under colonialism and now it, it becomes existential because say the planet may go, the planet is gone. 56 million people died uh, from the indigenous people, the planet is gone. There is no earth, there is no planet, just dead indigenous people and what have you. And this is what has made it difficult in many instances for Africans to really, some instances for Africans to deal with the question as an environmental question because for us, the colonial question is the environmental question. And so here we have in many instances, even the white people who love us in quotes, they're talking about a, 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 a green new deal. Uh, and because they're concerned about the environment. And the truth of the matter is that the, the change uh, uh, in the environment, the assault on the environment has actually uh, 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 resulted in melting uh, ice caps uh, and resulted in actually uh, the planet uh, 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 Earth itself uh, 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 developing a, um, another kind of a wobble uh, because of the ice melting and, and things like that. Uh, so it's a serious question. Comrade Secretary General talking about the death of species, hundreds of species, not, not hundreds of birds, not hundreds of bears, uh, not hundreds of monkeys, but species. Hundreds of species dying daily as a consequence of this. So it's a real serious question. It's a real serious threat. But it has always been a serious threat since we ran into the colonizers. And now what we have is that they talk about this, this green New Deal. And the New Deal uh, at, uh, is something that comes from uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, in the 30s and 40s when he was president of the United States and, uh, and to save the, the United States uh, from uh, the kinds of uh, struggles that, were, that, were, uh, that was uh, enveloping uh, much of, of the world due to the, uh, the economic depression that was here. Uh, he created this jobs programs and other kinds of things that employed people to build infrastructure, to build roads, and and to do a lot of other stuff. And so this is what the, 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 the Green New Deal is something that's been promoted and uh, uh, inside the United States. And also I see even the United Nations talking about the uh, Green uh, New Deal. Uh, but, but 
what what is this Green New Deal? Well, first of all, uh, they have to they have to promise jobs for white people. That's what part of it is about. Give a whole bunch of jobs because uh, uh, there's a huge struggle that's uh, uh, that's right now uh, uh, seemingly uh, off the radar that's happening within the white in the inside the United States among the, the settler population. It made itself brought to full view on January 6, uh, when you saw the settlers, some settlers attack the actual capital uh, of, the, of the United States. There's a huge struggle that's happening uh, in part because of economics, in part because of America losing its place uh, uh, in the world and its sense of self-worth and value, uh, because colonized peoples are taking back and fighting to regain our resources and this whole sense of the invincibility uh, and the ultimate goodness of whiteness, et cetera, is something that's at stake. And so a lot of white people are really uh, disturbed and emotion. And, and that's generally speaking throughout the country, uh, throughout the United States. And some of the white people are following Joe Biden and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and some follow Trump and these kinds of things, but none of them are fighting against the colonial system uh, that will liberate uh, our people. And so you have uh, this uh, real serious situation. So if, if in fact, uh, they're going to talk about uh, this this green deal, this this new uh, this green new deal. That's going to they're talking about uh, cutting emissions from uh, uh, from uh, 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 automobiles, uh, uh, combustible automobiles. They're talking about electrifying uh, most of the automotive, and then there are big corporations now uh, that are talking about by the two third two, 2030 or. Uh, uh, that most of their, their uh, automobiles, most of their transportation will be electrified. And this is something that some of them are really holding up. Wow, that's great, electrification. But electrification means what? Batteries, among other things. And the battery means cobalt. And the battery means co uh, chromium. And, and, and uh, it needs a lot of other resources that you'll find in Africa uh, and, in, 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 and throughout, uh, uh, throughout the Americas that are not uh, there in, in, uh, in in, in Europe as such. In fact, uh, China is making a big move in Ivory Coast. Uh, uh, when I say making a big move, uh, purchasing a lot of, uh, of, of, of some of these raw materials in order to, uh, to try and control as much as possible the whole production of, uh, of the battery making. Lithium is not part of what I'm talking about in, in South America, but uh, so you find this kind of thing happening. So they're digging holes. They're assaulting the environment in Africa more and more to bring clean energy to Europe and to North America. Uh, they, uh, even when they talk about the wind uh, 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 farms and things like that, uh, they are talking about using metals that they will be getting from Africa to make the blades and things like that. And then there's no place to get rid of them once that happens. They're even uh, talking more and more about uh, using uh, 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 atomic uh, energy uh, for uh, this new green uh, process that they are talking about. This comes out again at the expense of Africa. Comrade Secretary General was telling you the price that we pay in terms of the assault environment. You see our babies, our children, they, each, they literally have toddlers working in mines, black children, toddlers working in mines and then we bring in green energy. I mean, uh, again to Europe, again to America, et cetera. And guess what? Even as they electrify all of the automotive process in Europe and in uh, North America, uh, they got to get rid of the combustible vehicles as well. And the truth is that Africa is the largest market in the world for used automobiles. So what we're going to see is that they will take resources out of Africa to create what they call clean energy. Uh, in Europe and in North America uh, to, to get the cobalt, to get the chromium, and to get all this other stuff that they need to create what they call clean energy in Europe uh, by, uh, by deepening the contamination of the environment in Africa on, by that process. And then when Europe and North America gets rid of this combustible engine uh, vehicle, they send them to Africa, the largest market in the world for used cars. So this is an assault on Africa all the time. I, we don't have any way out of this. The, the, we've been facing this existential, this existential crisis that Europeans have just discovered. We've been facing this since Europeans discovered us, since we came into contact with Europe uh, and with the colonizers. And this is something that we really must understand that there is no future uh, for Africa. There's no future for the environment 
under colonial capitalism, it must be destroyed. That's why it's necessary to have the African People Socialist Party, the African Socialist International. Uh, we've got situations where some of the so-called leaders in Africa actually give allow uh, for European countries to dump all of their waste in Africa. It, this is this is what we are experiencing, and our children need to be able to grow up and and have decent lives and expect a decent future, but that won't happen under this system. And, and it won't happen, and this system will continue to exist as long as colonialism exists. And colonialism will continue to exist until African people have our own revolutionary party capable of stretching out throughout the globe. And when I say about the globe, I'm not just talking about Africa, I'm talking about in Guadalupe, I'm talking about Martinique, where people have been pausing on a regular basis through how the, the process of, uh, of farming uh, that's happening there and the French who control Guadalupe and Martinique and they've used these poison as pesticides, et cetera, where our, where our people are the ones who have been uh, uh, responsible for uh, doing uh, most of the agricultural farming for them. Uh, I'm talking about in the communities that we live in various places around the world. We are living with this stuff and we only way out of this is to make this revolution. And Africa and African people have to have access to our own revolutionary party. That's what we are presenting today with this African Liberation Day uh, discussion. So we are saying that the real environmentalists are the revolutionaries who are fighting against colonialism. And there is no other way out of here uh, except uh, destruction of colonialism. The exist existential crisis is one that's imposed on the world uh, by the existence of colonial capitalism. And we are that response. And so I just wanna say that I appreciate comment uh, 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 Secretary uh, General Louise's uh, presentation introducing this discussion to us. And uh, I want us to move forward. We have to build this party because it's not, we're not gonna, get rid of this by, by pleading and to the, um, to the corporations. This is what uh, many of the so-called environmentalists think they can do. They, some of them call themselves socialists and some call themselves communists. They're gonna plead to the corporations. The corporations are gonna act better. Uh, they're gonna uh, get rid of some of the environmentally harmful uh, things. They're gonna do stuff like uh, promise, get the corporation to promise to pay reparations to Africa uh, uh, for what they're doing to us. Uh, this is the kind of language we hear coming from the, the white people who like us. And they are not truly interested in changing the world if they're not interested in changing the conditions that, the, that this colonial world is imposing on Africa and other peoples around the world. So we have to build this party and we have to create uh, revolutionaries uh, who uh, uh, will uh, stop at nothing uh, to liberate our people and our children and our people don't need to live like uh, like colonialism uh, has determined we should live. We have to reverse this this verdict of imperialism. Uhuru, comrades. Uhuru, Uhuru, thank you, uh, S. G. Luizi and Chairman Omali Ishitala, for that presentation. Um, and again, that was on the question of how colonialism deteriorates the environment. We know you have questions for the chairman and secretary general, but before we do that, we have some important messages from our comrades. Uh, there's a video that we want to play um, and welcome uh, the program. Com and also want to welcome to the program comrades Ken Gozi and Basil to talk about economic self-reliance, Uhuru. My camera's not coming on. My camera's not coming on. There oh. we go. Basil, if you can start, because my camera's not coming on. Can I be heard? Okay. Yeah, you can be heard. You're, okay. you're hearing you loud and clear. All right, comrade. All right. Um, Uhuru, comrades. Uh, I want to I want to start off by um, 
reading a quote from the, the famous speech um, that Nkrumah made in 1963, where he said, we already reached the stage where we must unite or sink into the condition which has made Latin America the unwilling and distressed prey of imperialism after one and a half centuries of political independent, independence. And he went on to say, the unity of our continent no less than our separate independence will be delayed if indeed we do not lose it by hobnobbing with colonialism. Uh, go ahead, Ken Gozi, and, and you can acknowledge um, some of the folks who have contributed over the last two days. Uhuru, um, as of yesterday, first of all, we were trying to raise, uh, we were raising $3,000 and we've uh, have a total of $1,645 as of last night. And some of the contributions that came over after the broadcast were uh, Diop Odebola at $50, Jesse Neville, $100, uh, DJ Eddie, $20, Norman Jalil, $25. So I want to thank them and acknowledge them for their uh, late contributions yesterday. And the presentations you've heard by the chairman and, and uh, S.G. Luese, um, Tell you how colonialism has affected every aspect of our life, from the air we breathe to what we consume to sustain our lives. And it's just paramount that we uh, continue the fight that we're in to get this information out. African Liberation Day is just for one tool to get the uh, information to the masses. So today we need to raise uh, $1,355. And I'll start it out with a contribution of $25. You comrades can also go to um, uh, the website for our um, auction, and that's uh, 32 auctions forward slash um, for 32 auctions.com forward slash ALD 2021 and view some of the items that we have. Um, about that, uh, I want to talk about my contribution to the auction. Uh, I work with people in pain and athletes and so on. And I've uh, contributed a free a session with me virtually. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can, con uh, if you have problems with your back, back pain, I can definitely help you because I'm usually the guy that people come to. They've been to all kinds of doctors and everything. And then they find me and I solve the issue. So that's one of the things there on the auction. As you know, a nobody is going to be financing our revolution but us. So I urge you to go to that auction. We have some great things there. I mean, I want to also talk about the other one, my locks. There you go. <laughs> the, sister, the sister that offered a, a session to take care of your locks is the same sister that got my locks looking fly. So if you're going to be anywhere around in the Newark area, I suggest you go there and look at that, um, that uh, service there on the um, auction. Yeah, we state all the time that the solutions to our problems in our community is right here within our community. We can't look to our oppressor to, to solve anything. You know, colonialism is a horrible disease. Um, it's a virus. The chairman always says the colonial virus and socialism is the cure you know, and the African People's Social Party is the vaccine. We have the, we have the remedies, we have the Black Power Blueprint, we have everything we need right here. What we need is your support uh, materially, financially, or by um, joining and helping out in this work. And I like to always talk about connecting the dots. And I wanna read a quote here, a famous quote from Marcus Garvey whose work that this party is, is, is continuing to build upon, when he said, look for me in the whirlwind of the storm, look for me around you, for with God's grace, I shall come and bring with me countless millions of black slaves who have died in America and the West Indies and the millions in Africa to aid you in the fight for liberty, freedom, and life. 
So we got to finance that revolution. So get those contributions coming in, brothers and sisters and comrades. Ironically, that uh, quote is posted in very large uh, red, black, and green colors on the front of the Uhuru House in Oakland, California, for people to see. They stop and take pictures and take note and uh, sometimes even ask where it came from because a lot of people don't know about Garvey's, Garvey's work and it's up to us to put that word out and let them know that Garvey's uh, work is still continuing through the, us here at the African People's Socialist Party led by uh, Balia Shetela and uh, the theory of African internationalism. So let's get those contributions coming in and uh, we'll give you an update on what we had a little bit later and thank you. All right, Uhuru, uh, I just want to say finally that what this party is doing is con continuing that legacy, that struggle for African solidarity, the building the African worker state and destroying colonialism that started many centuries ago by our ancestors, Uhuru. So we must contribute. So we can hand it back over to you, Alikia or Yeshida. Uhuru, comrades. This is Yejide. Thank you so much for that fundraising call for the African People's Socialist Party and to build the African Liberation Day. And we encourage people to continue to bring through your donations throughout the program. And again, I'll repeat those links. Uh, to donate directly, go to aldhuru.org slash donate. And to participate in the auction, go to 32, the number 32 auctions dot uh, com slash ALD2021. Thank you so much for uh, that presentation. Uh, next, I wanna bring to the program my comrade, <laughs> uh, Jaina Balamumba, to talk about the importance of membership. Well, who are comrade Jaina Bala? Who are Jaina Bala? All right, who are comrades? There must be some technical difficulties with Jaina Bala's presentation. So uh, since she's not on this program right at the moment, or she's having some difficulty connecting, what I wanna say in her, the African People Socialist Party is calling on you, African people to step up to the plate. The time is now for us to stop being on the sidelines, talking about what we think is good for Africa. We are, at, we are creating a process, but we have a process that you can step into because this program is calling for the African revolutionary working class who is going to build the United Socialist Africa. We can't look outside of ourselves any longer. And so it's really important for us to understand our own significance in this process. Everything you've heard up until now, from earlier today in this program, from yesterday, is about winning the capacity for African people to take control, to govern. We're not playing about this. We are building the capacity to govern and to take power, not to ask for power, not to beg for power, not to sit at the table of imperial uh, capitalist colonialism and eke out whatever crumbs that they're willing to give, but to take power. And so if you are interested in being a part of this work to build the African worker state, we encourage you to go to our website, apspuhuru.org slash join to fill out our contact form. From there, our recruitment leaders will uh, contact you and let you know uh, about how you can begin your process into the African People Socialist Party. So I just really, really want to encourage you. I've been looking at all the chats that are happening on Facebook. I've seen the chats that are happening on YouTube and in Zoom. And you know, it really have we really have to draw on ourselves not to raise the contradictions like we can't solve them because the chairman laid out in, 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 with African internationalism that if capitalist colonialism, the, world's, uh, the world economy was built on the enslavement and colonization of Africa and African people, then the way that we overturn this parasitic relationship is for Africa and African people to reclaim our labor and our resources. And we can only do that through an organized process led by a singular theory that will, uh, that will inform the African masses around our responsibility to take power and, and build the African 
worker state. Because Kwame Nkrumah did this speech, to, you know, what we're referring to the speech at the, the forming of the uh, Organization of African Unity, uh, which is a neo-colonialist entity that was used to attack the, 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 the unity of the, the work that Kwame Nkrumah was doing to pull together a united Africa for our own, uh, our own um, purpose. But now we are here uh, uh, almost 50 years later and dealing with uh, having to destroy what uh, Kwame Nkrumah was uh, warning us against uh, all those years ago. Get out. So it's not time for us to be, you know, fiddling around and trying to figure out how we're going to get it done. The party is laying the groundwork. You saw a, a lot of the groundwork that has been made through our party's institutions yesterday, and the chairman and the secretary general is providing you the analysis through which we can really forge through anywhere that we are in the world. So the time is now for you to join. So I'm asking you comrades, Africans who really love Africa, who really uh, love African people, who wanna see the freedom and liberation, not in our children's lifetime, but in our lifetime, no matter how young or how old, do you wanna be a part of changing the world and changing the reality for African people so that we are no longer dealing with the oppression and exploitation that has marred our lives for hundreds and hundreds of years? It's time to take it back. And so we're calling on you Africans from wherever you are in the world, to join the African People's Socialist Party. Go to APSP Uhuru, that's APSP org slash join to fill out our contact form. Tell us why you wanna be uh, assigned to build the African working class. Tell us why you are interested in making sure that this in our lifetime, in your lifetime, that we can see a free and liberated Africa and our recruitment specialists will follow up with you to make sure that you are able to follow through on your commitment to yourselves, to your people, and to all African people to be a part of the African working class leadership and to bring down capitalist imperialism, which has destroyed the lives of all of our people uh, and continue to maintain its power over us. So comrades, uh, supporters, everybody who is looking who is African need to join the African People's Socialist Party and uh, sign up to be uh, a part of the vigilant African working class that is working to destroy this whole social system and build something new so that we can thrive and survive and defend our right to be African determined, uh, African self-determined. Uhuru, once again, go to apspuhuru.org slash join to fill out our contact form and someone from our recruitment department will get back to you so thank you so much, uh, comrades. Uh, comrade Ilikia, now you're up. Uhuru. Okay, I just got a message. So I'll go ahead and go introduce the, introduce the next section of our program, which is the question and answer section of our program. And so remember, if you are on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature that is on our Zoom and put your questions there. We can't really follow it in chat because a lot of activity is happening on chat. If you are on YouTube, place your questions inside the YouTube comment section and we have moderators in those sections to uh, take your questions. And remember, this section was about how colonialism deteriorates the environment and how uh, fighting this or challenging this or how building the African worker state will contribute to the downfall of the deterioration of, uh, of, of the world, basically. And so if you are on Facebook and YouTube, please put your comments, your questions in chat. You can also comment in chat, but we're really looking for questions during this segment of our program. Uh, so Uhuru. I see that we have some questions that came in uh, from YouTube and I'll read the first one to you, comrade. Uh, so the first one comes in from Adrian uh, on our Burning Spear TV. He, this person says, how do we navigate around modern indirect rule? I've noticed patterns of the West putting people in power in so many countries in order to exploit their resources and people. I think that can be answered by both or either, both were comrades. You see, how do we navigate? To what? I can reread it. I can reread it. How do we navigate around modern indirect rule? 
I have noticed patterns of the West putting people in power in so many countries in order to exploit the resources and people. Uh, how do we navigate? No, the question is, uh, we, we already say that, we have the uh, complete the, uh, the Black uh, Revolution. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah said neocolonialism, the indirect rule is the, uh, the last stage of, uh, of uh, imperialism. Uh, and what we see today is definitely a crisis for imperialism, and it's a permanent crisis for imperialism. Uh, the question for us is to to to, to have power. Uh, the question for us is to build our own movement because uh, we cannot coexist with uh, fascist capitalism, with colonialism. Uh, we have two options. The one option is colonial option, which basically be in peace with colonialism, and some people. That's what they refer to as navigate, you know, do what you can, survive as individual, things like that, which means we're going to live a life of uh, indignity as we experience everyday humiliation and things like that. Or we, we build the uh, revolutionary uh, movement, the international uh, movement for the unification of our African nation. We do that. And then uh, we go, you know, uh, on, we strike basically against our uh, fascist capitalism, against colonialism, and we build our own power. We reorganize uh, the world, we organize the economy. Uh, we build a real green economy, uh, which will not be based on colonialism, but we need the really needs uh, of, the, of, of the people uh, and things like that. And that's the options uh, that we have. And the only way uh, we can do that is to build this organization, to build the African People's Socialist Party. And this way, maybe, uh, if I understand, through the question, we can navigate uh, because we're building our own power. We're trying to change the balance of power. We're building what we call, you know, dual and containing power institutions. This way we navigate, but on our own terms. We don't navigate on the terms of imperialism. That's what we do in the outside the, the uh, resistance against uh, imperialism, outside the organization. As individuals, that's what we do. And um, Doing that basically uh, is a is a form of surrender because uh, it's a uh, living in peace with imperialism. So join the movement. That's the best way to begin uh, your navigation uh, until we achieve power. Yeah, I or, think uh, it's important to say that uh, what this African Liberation Day event, uh, under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, is about, is building uh, the capacity. We we putting down revolutionaries. That's what this organization is about. Every, in every place Africans are located in the world. Our objective is to take power. Uh, and and uh, we navigate around them uh, by overturning them. We organize the capacity uh, to take power in those places where they represent uh, our enemies, where they represent a foreign and, uh, uh, power. Uh, they have to be overturned. That's all, this is it's, uh, simple. There's no easy way around it. There's no way that we're gonna be able to seduce them out of power. There's no way uh, because they look like us, they might do the right thing or something like that. We have to build an organized capacity. That's what this party building process we're involved in now is about. And uh, uh, that's why we have to have the long view. Our objective is to, is to take power over Africa. And to do that, we have to have organization. And in those organizations, we have to have dedicated cadre uh, who uh, that's what we live for. And, and which makes us different in so many ways than ordinary people we know. We are African internationalists. It means that there's nothing, 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 nothing more important uh, to us uh, than overturning this hostile uh, foreign and alien power that dominates Africa either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. So join the party and wherever you are, uh, then it's your responsibility in, in uh, united with all the other uh, uh, African internationalists globally uh, to fight for power, take it where we can take it. And then when you take it wherever you're located at, uh, you, when I say you, I don't mean you as an individual, when we accomplish it there, it gives us a foothold uh, from that location that we can use to, uh, to, uh, uh, to really escalate the struggles of uh, African liberation in other places we're located. It's gotta go. And so all of these uh, so-called indirect rulers, they gotta go. Uh, that's that's the only way forward. Nobody else has ever won freedom without doing that. We're not going to win it without doing that either. Uhuru, Uhuru uh, thank you, Chairman, for the response to that question. We have a question on Facebook from uh, Comrade Chimarenga Salimbao, who says, Uhuru, Chairman, please answer the question. 
can the environment be saved without the destruction of colonial slash capitalism? Uh -huh. Well, you know, can Africans be saved without the destruction of colonial slash capitalism? The, the fact is that uh, there is no hope for the environment or for the planet. Uh, without the uh, destruction of colonial capitalism. I think that uh, even uh, if it were not done as efficiently and effectively as it could have been done, what we've said up to now clearly shows that the assault on the environment began with the assault on Africa and the colonized peoples of the world, that that's the foundation uh, uh, of the, uh, the everything uh, that's happening uh, to the planet. And if we want uh, for the planet to have life, then we're gonna to have to attack it at the foundation. And that is the colonial capitalist question. Colonialism is the foundation that the whole thing rests upon. It's gotta go. Ohuru, thank you. Can I just uh, say, uh, just, ahead, in, uh, just, uh, just say that the uh, colonialism itself is, uh, is, uh, is also uh, an assault on environments itself. And uh, you know there is no way we can keep it. Yes, well. Ohoro, we have a question from YouTube uh, from Zetegu Anderson, the Zodiac Show. Uh, whatever happened to let us return to Africa, the land of our fathers, is that even a part of your agenda? Same question. Is mm -hmm. repatriation on the agenda for this organization? <laughs> we want to go to a free Africa. And, and, uh, and we, we are in Africa. I mean, when you say return to Africa, I mean, we are in Africa. We, in, we are uh, in South Africa. We are in Sierra Leone and Ghana. We are in, in uh, Uganda, in, in Tanzania. Uh, we are in Africa, but we are other places as well. And this is what gives uh, our presence in Africa real significance uh, because we can make a strategic uh, uh, a fight uh, for the liberation of Africa. Any notion that somehow going to a colonized, oppressed, uh, exploited Africa uh, <clears throat> is a solution uh, is just, it's just an incorrect uh, notion. The fact is that Africa is dominated by uh, imperialism. And, uh, and, and it's even, in, in most instances, it's the indirect uh, power, indirect uh, white power. It is colonialism, neo-colonialism. It's gotta go. There's no easy way out of this. We, you can repatriate yourself uh, uh, on an airline that uh, is run and created uh, by, by France or by the United States or British, Britain, et cetera, uh, to get to your Africa. Uh, but the fact is that until we take our power, it won't make any difference where you are. You can be in New Jersey, you're gonna catch hell uh, by the same capitalism. It kills us everywhere and it kills us in Africa too. If you just look at some of the pictures that we've just shown, the numbers of Africans who are dying on the continent of Africa today because of a system that is global, we have to have a global stretch as well as a revolutionary movement. Yes. SD, I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah, I just want to say uh, just uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, two things. Uh, we, uh, if someone for example, is, is, is listening to this and it's no base, uh, it might be based in Africa, maybe. I you know the person who asked the question, but somebody watching there, we want the, all Africans to know, particularly if you're on the African continent, that uh, the struggle the struggle for African liberation is not just in Africa, it's around the world. And uh, you have to pay attention and you have to be part of the same struggle taking place in Brazil, the Caribbean, the United States, and South. It's your struggle too. And uh, it's not just a question of Africans uh, who are outside Africa going home. It's also the Africans who are at home to be part of the struggle is taking place outside Africa. That's really important. We have like fronts like uh, the, new the New Caledonia. That's where nickel, nickel is one of the key mineral used in electronic component like the coltan, and uh, they produce something like a quarter, roughly a quarter of it. That's why France makes sure they control it. They need the unity of all black uh, freedom fighters. They need the unity of, of the black power movement. You know, all Africans have to be part of it because they are isolated. You know, uh, they are not in Africa, not in Europe, not in America, but in the Pacific Island. And you have Africans in West Papua. Uh, so they need our support too, because they're African too. They've been away from Africa for thousands and thousands of years and, and uh, things like that. So it's really, really significant uh, that uh, we say, you know, we all go fighting for liberation for Africa, 
but we're also fighting for the unification of the African nation, which means, uh, you know, uh, yeah, revolutionary uh, unity for our, all our struggle and solidarity, if I, I might speak so, wherever we are. Or, Uhuru, Uhuru, thank you both uh, Chairman and Ezri Luezi for the answer to that question. Um, I am seeing these questions are not directed to anybody, so either one of you can choose to answer this. We have a question from YouTube um, into at Abdul Sharif that says, would you say Indo-European Arabs are our friends? Did they enslave our people for the European? Uhuru. You know, Chairman has, has spoken to that many times, you know. So let's just say that uh, uh, we are now liquidating the contradiction that exists between Africans, Arabs, so Africans and, and, and white people. But uh, regarding uh, uh, Arabs and uh, other non-Africans who live in Africa or to whom uh, we have uh, a relationship like the Indians, Pakistani, and people like that, uh, we recognize the contradiction that exists, but the most important thing is to recognize first the main contradiction uh, that needs to be resolved so that we can resolve other contradictions, secondary contradictions. At the moment, the main contradiction is between oppressor uh, nations and oppressed nations, particularly between the African nation and the white power nation. And if you look around the world, we just demonstrate for Palestine. We recognize Palestinian people are Arabs, but they are colonized people. We recognize that. And we know the weakening of uh, or the defeat of Israel, colonial state, is good for all colonized people. We recognize that too. And the unity of all colonized people against the colonizers is important. Uh, we talk about historical relationship that start developing uh, between Algeria, uh, remember Mate Fanon, who was representing Algeria uh, in a 1958 conference coming from organized. Uh, the Algerians were ready uh, to united with the struggle taking place in the Congo is only the opportunity when the Africans in the Congo that prevented the Nigerians to come in the way, in the way able, ready to send, you know, enemy weapons, you know, uh, even send the Nigerians to come and, and, uh, and the struggle there. You saw the unity between uh, Kwame Kuma and NASA uh, in Egypt. All these are historical uh, uh, realities. So we always say that the struggle for the uh, liberation of Africa is the struggle for all Africans, but also everybody who lives in Africa has to unite with the struggle or with the mission of the African working class, which means the uh, unification of Africa, removal of all borders and creation of the Black Power State. And we recognize also a nation can exist uh, on our military, uh, you can say uh, national basis, that uh, is uh, essentially Black, but no Black can also uh, uh, be part of, of the nation because it will not be based on any uh, on any uh, predation, no predators, no colonialism. You know, it will be a socialist state, uh, you know, uh, something like that. Uh, we also have an example of Haiti. Remember Haiti where Dessalines and the others declared that anybody, uh, only black people can uh, own land in Haiti. But AC went far out to say that you know anybody was prepared to you know uh, to accept the rule of uh, of uh, of the black revolutionaries there, like the Polish, who ran away from uh, the Napoleon army, uh, who prepared to fight with us. Uh, they can be given also the nationality of being Haitians, you know. Uh, so we all these things is something uh, people may have heard uh, before. So we organize that, but for white people. The chairman came with the uh, solution of a reparation struggle that uh, to open the door to white people who want to rejoin humanity, uh, uh, we have to make self criticism of their collaboration and participation to colonialism. They have to commit national suicide, you know, reject any predatory uh, objective to leave of black people, but to unite with black power uh, in a white face. You know, all these are really, really uh, examples. We are revolutionaries, we want a revolutionary solution that will transform the world, transform humanity, uh, not to only free the African nation, but free humanity from colonialism, or any kind of system of uh, exploitation of uh, humans, you know, by humans or something like that. You know, that's what we're fighting for. So we bring that to, to be able to solve any contradiction that might exist between Africans uh, and Arabs. So revolution must be uh, really, really central to that. Or, 
I think that's I think that's the essential answer. I mean, the fact is that uh, uh, we uh, have not ignored uh, this contradiction that has existed between Arabs and Africans. Um, uh, the fact is, uh, uh, today in the world that we live in, uh, there's a global, there's a world economy. Uh, everything happens within the context of that world economy. Uh, and the power is centralized in that world economy. And that's a capitalist world economy. And that's an economy that's uh, right now, as shaky as it is, is dominated by, by Europeans, uh, whether they're in Europe or in other places around the world. So the fact is that uh, 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 we can overturn our oppression by overturning uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, colonizers. But you don't, you can, I can't see how you, we get free by, by attacking Arabs or anything like that. The struggle is not uh, to fight against people who just done something bad to us and that's, we are angry about it. The struggle is how do we uh, free our people? How do we end the misery? How do we take our land, our nation back, uh, our, our national homeland back? Uh, and, uh, and it's gonna take unification to do that. And uh, that uh, the Arabs can commit national suicide. Uh, we saw Ben Bella. Uh, 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 at the, I mentioned um, at the beginning of this that, that uh, uh, you, OAU uh, founding event in, uh, in, uh, that happened in 1963. And uh, Kenneth Kaunda, who uh, was the president of uh, Zambia, Zambia? Zambia, wasn't yes. it? That's yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and one of the things that he wanted to do was pass a resolution saying, some, wanted to pass a resolution saying the first thing we need to do is to create an all African bank. That's Kenneth Calhoun, a black man uh, from uh, Africa, sub-Saharan, if you will. And it was Ben Bella said, the first thing we need to do is to create uh, 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 an all African uh, blood bank uh, and march on that, that uh, government in South Africa, that white nationalist government in South Africa destroyed. Ben Bella uh, was speaking as an African there at, a, at the Organization of African Unity. Uh, and so uh, depending on uh, the strength and, and uh, clarity of the African revolution, uh, there is room uh, within this process of uh, establishing a nation of African people based on the principles of uh, united Africa, based on the principle of the destruction of uh, all uh, oppression and exploitation and the fight for black power. And as Comrade Louisa just mentioned uh, in Haiti, uh, uh, the, 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 the movement there and with victory didn't just say uh, you can become Haitian. They said every only one who can own land, black people, black, 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 black people. He said, but uh, 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 that uh, uh, Poles and some others who fought uh, for uh, this revolution will be considered black. So you can be black. And, uh, 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 you know, so, that's, 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 that's possible. We, we, we're fighting for freedom and for a new, uh, decent world. And I think, uh, I think we are pretty clear on that. Uhuru. Uhuru, we're going to look at our last question for... Uh, yeah, yeah, just one other thing in relationship to that. Because, Comrade Louise, you know this. Uh, uh, at a time when I was traveling in various places in Africa and I've been in meetings, and you probably participate in these meetings too, uh, there's a sector uh, uh, of the of African, I don't know if you call them militants, I think some of them really work with the CIA, who are uh, saying that uh, we can't fought, fight for uh, the total Africa, that we have to fight for just Africa south of the Saharan desert, and that uh, the rest of that is just Arabs and et cetera, and we can't have that kind of unity. Yeah. Now, the thing is, they don't say nothing about not uniting with the neo colonial puppet regimes in places where they live. I know where they live. And they live under neo-colonial domination where, uh, where you know, we're talking about shell oil, uh, the spoiling all of the, the, the rivers and, and, and animal life and, and et cetera, et cetera. They even put in Ghana, I see some of them there. Uh, and, and the fact is that nobody's talking about, none of them is talking about the neo-colonial puppet regimes that turned Africa over to white power. And so, you know, it's just, this it's a, it's a way to divide the possibility of a genuine United Revolutionary Movement. And we don't want to do that. We want to destroy imperialism and we recognize that Africa is the central question. And actually, we are convinced in the African People's Socialist Party uh, that the actual uh, world uh, revolution 
uh, that will bring uh, a whole socialist world is centered in Africa. That is, Africa is the critical, it's the linchpin uh, to this, uh, this uh, world revolution that all of the communists claim that they've been fighting for uh, uh, since Marx. Africa is the central force. That's where it's gonna come from as a consequence of making this revolution by Africans in Africa and all of the other places where Africans are located. Uhuru. Yes, Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru, Iligyama, may I just say something quickly? Uh, uh, yeah. This question of uh, African Arabs, uh, also uh, another aspect of it, you know, like uh, the United States, and Israel, and all of them, they have managed to get Sudan split. They created South Sudan and the other Sudan. Uh, supposedly, would they manipulate, you know, the, the lie to Africans that South Sudan is African and the other Sudan is Arab. It's a lie. Yeah. So yeah. if you go in the other Sudan, uh, it's Africans. That might be Arab states, sure, but it's Africans, you know. Yeah. Uh, then then uh, when it comes to Sahara, the Africans there. You have Tuaregs and people like that. And when you go to a place like uh, Morocco, Africans are, are Morocco. Uh, we, we are the indigenous people of, of, uh, of Africa. Tunisia, at least 10 to 15 percent population is African, it's black. You know, uh, Egypt, Africans are there. Uh, Mauritania, Africans are there. And uh, more than that, there is an uh, African in the US who gave uh, his, his uh, what they call it, his bone, uh, something like that, so they can uh, trace uh, his origin in Africa. And after studies, you know, they realized that, uh, or the history came out that uh, uh, African population or Homo sapiens, um, uh, evidence for Homo sapiens in Morocco is dated 300,000 years ago. That beats most places, you know, we've been told before, like in East Africa, that is deep, 300,000 years ago. Africans, so basically, South Desert didn't even exist. The Africans moved from Morocco to Central Africa, East Africa, and so on. So our history is all over Africa. So and that's why I don't like this term of uh, sub-Saharan Africans. The poetry is just bombarding us all the time, you know, uh, you know, which is consistent with those Africans saying, yes, be concerned about sub-Saharan Africans, forget about the rest. No, we want all of Africa. Yeah, that's look, at, I'm like. look at Yemen. I mean, uh, 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 exactly. uh, Queen of Sheba had a palace in Yemen, you know, uh, yes. so I mean, yeah, don't, we're not conceding uh, Africa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, even today, some of the Yemenis are just black. I know, yeah. You know, yeah, <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, sure. Uhuru. Well, um, at first I was going to say there's another question, but you guys both actually just answered that. Um, Chairman, you kind of just answered it in your answer right before Louise about what kind, you know, how different Africans around the world, uh, what work we can be doing to, you know, not only make an impact in Africa, but to forward this African revolution. So, uh, with that being said, that actually concludes this portion, uh, the Q&A portion of the program. And I'm going to thank the chairman and SG Luezi for your participation so far Uhuru. and invite uh, my co-host yesterday to come back to the screen. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, comrades, thank you so much for all of your insight. You were answering questions you didn't know were being asked. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I think that is so helpful, uh, particularly around the whole question of Arabs in Africa and, and how we need to unite against uh, neocolonialism and white power and uh, really unite our effort, the efforts that every anti-colonial struggle is happening around the world to kill that. Otherwise, we are just giving power to the division of Africa. So I just, I really appreciate that. And I also really appreciate um, the discussion around the environment and how colonialism has changed the landscape of the entire planet um, uh, from everything that you laid out from digging in the mines to the enslavement of African people to all the things that have been used to destroy the environment and basically change the entire ecosystem and how this question is being taken on by the white left as some sort of green new deal when for African people it's like you know we just got to take power to right the wrongs of colonialism to overturn what they have done so that we can continue to build a, a planet that everybody can live on. And um, I think with that, it's a really great segue into our next section um, where I'm introducing to our program, Dr. Aisha Fields, who is the director of the All African Peoples Development and Empowerment Project. 
the international director. Um, the APDEP, as we call it, uh, is a US-based nonprofit organization that was founded in 2007. As the group's director, Dr. Aisha Fields is responsible for coordinating African community-led healthcare, healthcare, agriculture, and educational programs throughout the US on the continent of Africa and African communities worldwide. They've built clean water systems, vocational and nursery schools, community farms, maternity centers, and a variety of youth and adult educational programs. They also established the Project Black Onc, which is, which is our uh, answer to the American Red Cross, um, to provide um, African community-based uh, disaster relief responding to hurricanes in Texas, Ebola in Sierra Leone, and now COVID-19 worldwide. I want to welcome to our program, Comrade Dr. Aisha Fields, to give her presentation. Uhuru, Comrade. Uhuru. Uhuru, Comrade, I really want to thank you for that introduction. And, uh, and just to say that I'm really honored to participate in this 2021 African Liberation Day, which is being organized by our party, Vanguard Party of the African Working Class, African People's Socialist Party. Um, and I want to begin my presentation by saluting my leadership, uh, Chairman Omalia Chatella, the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party and the leader and founder of the Uhuru Movement. Um, I wanna also salute the architect of the Black Power Blueprint, deputy chair of our party, Ona Zanea Chatella, uh, the secretary general of the African Socialist International, Comrade Louise Kinshasa, uh, the veteran organizer and APSP director of organization, Comrade Chimarenga Selimbao, and the rest of the members of the international leading body of the African People's Socialist Party. And I also really just wanna salute all of the organizers of uh, today's African Liberation Day. So um, APDEP was formed by the African People's Socialist Party in 2007. And our mission is to win African people around the world to contribute our skills towards building African community-led development programs in four areas. Um, those areas are agriculture, education, healthcare, disaster preparedness, and emergency response. Uh, the chairman, Malia Shetela, in the political report to the seventh Congress of the African People's Socialist Party reminded us of the revolutionary strategy that APDEP was formed to carry out. And so I'm just gonna give a quote uh, from the chairman's political report to our seventh Congress. So Chairman says that APDEP is an important African internationalist organization that opens the door to the struggle for African liberation to an often overlooked sector of the African population. Indeed, Africa suffers from what is often characterized as a brain drain of skilled professionals. These Africans in whom Africa has invested so much often end up as doctors, nurses, and engineers in the US and Europe, while Africa is deprived of the benefit of these skills that should contribute to our development. This is an obvious difference in what we witness with Cuban doctors who often leave Cuba in great numbers to bring health care to impoverished colonial countries. This is partially due to the fact that the Cuban doctors are informed by a revolutionary perspective that promises the liberation of the oppressed. APDEP provides us an opportunity to take the revolutionary philosophy of African internationalism to skilled African workers to win them to willingly endure any hardship in the process of contributing their skills to the liberation of our Africa. A part of APDEP's task is to influence, indeed induce class suicide when possible, or at minimum harness their te technical expertise to the interests of the African nation as defined by the advanced detachment uh, of the African uh, uh, nation, the African People's Socialist Party, vanguard of the African working class. And so that's the end of that quote from the chairman's political report to the seventh Party Congress. So it's clear that um, through APDEP, our party has begun to develop the practical means by which African people all around the world can unite and organize our skills, build practical programs that improve our material conditions and the quality of life, that increase our capacity, to once again, become a self-reliant, self-determining people that negates the role that the colonial state plays in our lives. APDEP was created by the party as our vehicle through which Africans with specialized skills can stop simply selling them to the highest imperialist bidder and instead to bring those skills back home into the process that will free our people from the abusive colonial relationship that has been imposed on us for 600 years. 
Uh, our work is not reformist or charity work. It's revolutionary anti-colonial work. It is conscious of itself as a tool to defeat, defeat colonialism. In my presentation today, I wanna show some of the work that we've done uh, to organize our people towards self-government, to begin to create the structures of the emergent black worker state. Um, APDEP's programs, again, they fall under four broad categories that I mentioned um, in the very beginning of the presentation. Those areas are agriculture, education, healthcare, and emergency response and disaster preparedness. And I'm gonna start um, the presentation discussing our agricultural work, which is important for quite a number of reasons. Um, we can maybe just go to the next slide, uh, comrade. So Thomas Sankara, uh, the revolutionary leader of Burkina Faso reminded us that he who feeds you controls you. So um, that really engages in our agricultural work where we build community gardens, community farms, um, garden collectives and a variety of other uh, uh, agricultural programs, recognizing that, well, first of all, as S.G. Louise said in his opening presentation, that African people have, um, you know, as the first people on earth, obviously have always had the capacity to feed ourselves. We have um, vast agricultural knowledge that, um, you know, that we've had uh, since human beings, since Africans, you know, uh, began to attempt to, you know, feed ourselves. And um, historically, um, you know, even in this, actually, even in this most recent period, you know, African people were brought to the Americas, uh, you know, uh, there were agriculturalists, you know, who were brought here to take on the agricultural work that was the foundation of this colonial capitalist, you know, economy. And, you um, you know, we recognize that, uh, you know, in African people being uh, captured and uh, dispersed throughout the world, and we've been robbed of our right to self-determination, and that we've been feeding the white world, um, uh, even as our own communities uh, suffer from, you know, from, from famine, as they suffer from lack of decent food, as Africans in the middle of the you know, uh, wealthiest countries in the world, you know, live in food deserts. And so the most basic capacity of a self-determining, self-governing people, which is what we're striving to be once again, is to be able to feed ourselves. And so our agricultural work, um, it allows us to share those skills that we already have in our community, allows those who have specialized kind of agricultural skills um, to, you know, to share those skills, um, you know, with the community. And our community gardens are not just places, uh, you know, where we're combating food deserts, which we are, or where we're helping to feed um, ourselves, which we are, but they're also organizing spaces. These are places where we hold important political discussions and where we uh, become deeply entrenched in the community where we can capture territory. That is um, a primary role that our community gardens play, and that is to become liberated Uhuru territories wherever we possibly can. So this is a picture of our Northwood Uhuru Community Garden in Huntsville, Alabama. You go to the next uh, picture, please. This is another view. We grow everything from tomatoes to cucumbers to herbs and you know, watermelon, everything you can think of. We grow in raised beds and underground um, garden as well. You go to the next picture. Some of the sweet potatoes we harvested last fall in our garden. To the next one, please. Um, we recently, uh, this season, uh, began a partnership with um, a local church called St. Bartley Primitive Baptist Church, where we have initiated a second community garden, in the Northwood community of Huntsville. And this is something that we're really excited about because. Uh, Part of what we want to be able to do is to, you know, um, to work with other churches and, um, you know, throughout not only Alabama, but throughout, you know, uh, African communities everywhere. We know that's where, you know, uh, many of our people are organized. And through these relationships that we're establishing um, with churches, uh, we're able to win them to practical programs of app and to win them into uh, a relationship 
uh, with the African liberation movement through, uh, you know, through the political education and above all the, the common interests that, you know, we have in um, making sure that the African community uh, can take care of itself. So this is our second uh, Uhuru Garden uh, in Huntsville, Alabama that was recently consolidated this spring. We can go to our next picture, please. This is a picture of our oldest community garden in Houston, Texas. This is our Gwen Archie Community Garden in Fifth Ward, Houston, where um, this garden is was developed under the leadership of veteran organizer, um, you know, uh, Comrade Omawali K. Fing, who passed away uh, recently, uh, but who was um, in so many ways just critical to the development of our party around the world and, and specifically our APDEP work in Houston. And this garden has housed, you know, African Martyrs Day, has, uh, you know, Juneteenth, a uh, variety of, you know, political uh, mobilizations. And we grow everything from bananas. You can see our one of our banana trees um, on the screen to sugar cane, watermelon, again, a variety of, of fruits and vegetables that we grow and harvest in our fifth work community garden in Houston. You go to the next uh, slide, please. These are just some of the pictures of some of our members and volunteers who are working in our Houston garden. Can we go to the next one, please. And I just want to extend an invitation to everybody to join us, if you can, in Houston, Texas on June 19th for our seventh annual Juneteenth Festival. This year it is in honor of Comrade Omawali Kefin. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have a picture of Omawali here, and we're going to be know, taking this uh, Juneteenth on as an opportunity to like to re-dedicate ourselves to the development of the Hura movement in Houston, Texas. Um, and for more information, you can check us out on, on Eventbrite to register for this uh, year's Juneteenth. You can go to the next slide, please. So the next um, area that I want to talk about of APDEP's work is our educational work. And I think this is really important because we have to understand that Colonial schools exist uh, for one main purpose, and that is to maintain the status quo. And in colonial schools, our children are indoctrinated to obey and respect US and European rule over our lives and land. Um, it's there that we learn to accept the falsification of world history and the slander of African, Mexican, and other colonially oppressed people um, in our, you know, in our history and our personality and culture. Colonial schools are an attack on African other colonized people. And for many, many years, uh, I served, I was a teacher in the colonial education system. And I can attest to the fact that um, as uh, one of our comrades, uh, the Black is Back Coalition constantly says, mice uh, don't educate, I'm sorry, cats don't educate mice, they eat them. And that's what happens to African children in the colonial education system. So go to the next slide, please. So um, after, uh, you know, APDEP, our educational programs fundamentally play the role of propagating the liberation philosophy of African internationalism and providing our people an opportunity to learn and share the skills that are need needed to further uh, the African revolution. And um, one of our, actually our primary educational program at the moment is our Marcus Garvey Youth Program. And the first principle of unity uh, for our for people to participate in our Marcus Garvey Youth Program, the recognition first of all that African children are brilliant, African children are capable, they want to learn, um, and also that African children are an integral part of the African nation, must be given the leadership, organizational, and the practical skills needed to contribute to the success of the African liberation movement. So African children from Marcus Garvey Youth Program are able to learn, uh, you know, important. Uh, practical skills, survival skills, along with giving um, the understanding uh, of who they are uh, and their responsibility in, in the African nation for the African liberation movement. And we are consciously building young African internationalists. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So some of the programs that we offer our children in the youth and Marcus Garvey Youth Program our survival, I'm, I'm sorry, not survival, this is survival. <laughs> our uh, self-defense skills, go to the next slide. Go to the next slide, please. 
um, you know, how to grow our own food. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, along with you know, giving African children an opportunity to express uh, our, their understanding of, of, you know, of the African revolution and who African leaders are. This is a picture, some pictures from this year's um, Marcus Garvey Youth Program um, essay contest, where we had children from Senegal, uh, Sierra Leone, um, Nigeria, and the US uh, offer their submissions on who is their favorite African revolutionary and why. And then here on the left, we have pictures of our first, uh, second and third place winners and all of the children did an excellent job and are being invited to participate uh, in our Marcus Garvey Youth Program. To the next slide, please. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I know I don't have much time. Um, our other, one of our other areas of work is our healthcare work. We've done a lot of work to develop our own independent healthcare system uh, under the leadership of the party. And we have um, recruited and we continue to recruit African doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals to become Uhuru doctors, taking the responsibility for the health of the African nation, their participation in African programs. Over the years, we've taken on the question of infant and maternal health, as we can see in this picture, where uh, we're in front of in 2013, one of APDEP's maternal health care centers, uh, some of the children who were birthed through the infant and maternal health care program that APDEP um, initiated in Sierra Leone. Uh, we've also trained hundreds of community health workers on things like the prevention, identification, and treatment of waterborne diseases, to, uh, prevention and identification of Ebola virus disease, and we have developed other healthcare programs that meet the needs of African people around the world. You can go to the next slide, please. As the Doctor Series, which was initiated uh, this last year, brings African healthcare and mental health workers into the embrace of APDEP, offering them an opportunity to contribute their skills and knowledge to the African nation at large. This is one of our most recent Ask the Doctor Series where we discussed uh, the question of from, going from collective mourning to organized resistance. Um, and this was a dynamic presentation, dynamic uh, webinar uh, that helped us to really dive into the question of, uh, of, of mental health for African people and uh, what it is that we need to do to be uh, moved from a place of mourning you know, the situation that we're in as colonial subjects and becoming organized uh, African people. So if you can move to the next slide, please. Our AYA resistance circles give African people a space to discuss and engage in revolutionary wellness using the theory of African internationalism to understand colonial domination um, as the root cause of the emotional and mental unwellness experienced by all African people in one way or another. Um, our AYA resistance circles put African people in the best possible mental and emotional space to be able to fight back and also recognize, as France Fanon shared, that mental illness is high among the colonized when resistance is low and the best thing a colonized person can do achieve wellness is to kill the colonizer. So we can go to the next slide, please. Oh, and I wanna invite folks to attend our next AYA Resistance Circle, which is gonna be Friday, May the 30th at 7 p.m. Central Time. And you can go to developmentforafrica.org uh, to register for that, uh, for that next circle. So uh, APTA has also created Project Black Aunt. Uh, in, it was created in 2014 in response to the West uh, Africa Ebola epidemic. And it is the African Nations Humanitarian Aid and Disaster Relief Program. Our primary mission is to carry out relief operations to assist African victims of natural disasters, other emergencies, anywhere they may occur in the African world. Go to the next slide, please. So this is a picture um, of, uh, you know, where there are ongoing um, natural disasters or other kind of disasters. And if you can see, vast majority of them are concentrated on the in the continent of Africa and in other places where African and other colonized people are, but primarily in Africa. At all times, whether we see it on the news or not, there are, you know, there, there's flooding, there are cholera outbreaks, there are dengue outbreaks, there are Ebola outbreaks, there are a variety of ways in which African people are being hit hard by, uh, by emergencies and peerless imposed disasters. And uh, through Project Black Ankh as a responsibility, helping to mobilize the African nation to be able to have our own ability to respond to these uh, to these disasters. We go to the next slide. 
We can all remember when the Haiti earthquake happened and African people everywhere, you know, felt that just like we felt it, uh, it during Katrina, just like, you know, uh, you know, we felt it in other times. We recognized um, that African people, you know, that we, we, we want to be able to respond. And until uh, Black Ankh was consolidated, we had no way to do that uh, as the African nation. And the best we could do was to give maybe to some kind of charity organization or religious organization, which have only shown time after time after time to be poverty pimps, to, to use the misery of African people to generate resources that are, uh, and to create experiences for white people. And now through Project Black on uh, you know, all that has, is, is in the process of being changed. If we can go to the next slide. Please. So this is the beginning of Project Black Onk, responding to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, where we train 50 community health workers on the prevention and identification of Ebola virus disease. Go to the next slide, please. Where we connected with 40 Ebola survivors and their families, providing them with food, water, sanitation supplies, and medicines. Go to the next slide, please. And here we see some of our more current uh, work that was activated under Project Black Onk. As we all know, we're, we're still currently in the middle of a uh, pandemic. You know, the COVID-19 colonial virus as a chairman helps us understand pandemic. And uh, that, uh, uh, under the leadership of the party uh, helped to lead our uh, People's War Commission, which helped to develop very early on protocols, uh, strategies that the African nation could use to be able to understand how to move to minimize our risk of COVID-19 and to you know, to know um, how to prepare ourselves and our families and our communities. And even prior to uh, the CDC saying that that African, I mean that people needed to wear masks when you know we were out here just openly, you know, engaging this virus, um, the People's War Commission under Project Black Om was taking literature by the thousands throughout the African world, letting people know uh, that we did need to wear masks, teaching people how to create our own masks, again, offering protocols, how to build our immune systems uh, and, and you know, how to, how to prepare ourselves and how to treat ourselves if we were to contract COVID-19. And these are pictures of some of our party organizers, uh, you know, distributing that literature. Next slide, please. We also established our COVID-19, our international COVID-19 telehealth program, which has since July of last year offered uh, African people around the world access to free appointments with our doctors, uh, with our APDEP doctors under, uh, our, uh, under this program. We've taken appointments from throughout Africa, Europe, uh, various parts of the United States, uh, and still uh, are taking appointments to this day. We're transitioning this program to go beyond COVID-19, also to deal with other, um, uh, you know, uh, colonial uh, diseases that confront African people and to give them access to free health care no matter where we are as African people. So if we can move on, I'm going to be wrapping up. So just to say that um, where we're headed now also with Project Back On, because we're in the process of developing our own uh, emergency, I'm sorry, our own um, medical response teams. And we're inspired by the work of the, of the Cuban government and the Cuban medical uh, professionals and medical brigades that uh, go around the world offering um, you know, other colonized uh, countries and other people around the world access to the medical expertise of Cuban doctors. And in many cases are the only doctors that people have anywhere. And we're inspired by this example uh, uh, that Cuba has set. If you go to the next slide, please and are in the process of developing the process for, for APDEP uh, doctors uh, under the leadership of our Project Black Onc Medical Advisory Team to develop our own medical response teams, uh, much like those of the Cuban Henry Reeves Brigades that will be able to travel around the world. And we're in the process of working on, you know, on, on plans to uh, potentially you know, travel to Cuba and work with Cuban, uh, medical, Cuban trained medical doctors to be able to help us with that process. So if we can move on, um, I want to encourage people, can you go to the next slide and I'm wrapping up. I want to encourage people to check out our economic institutions Zenzele Zelle Consignment. You can go to develop, I mean, you can go to zenzeleconsignment.com to see the African clothing and other important um, other items that we have for sale that help to support the programs. 
of APDEP and just wrap up by saying that APDEP is obviously a clear example, along with our dual power economic and other programs that the party has established. Uh, there are you know, examples of the evidence of the emergent African nation, black power state being forwarded by our party. Uh, in fact, our chairman Omalia Shatella has suggested that we should consider APDEP's work as a part of the process of developing a post-colonial independent African government ministry of development empowerment. Um, APDEP members around the world recognize and we take on this responsibility. And I wanna encourage anybody who's participating in this, uh, this uh, African liberation today who is not a member of the African People's Socialist Party or the Hoover Movement to join uh, today. Uh, uh, African people who have skills or interests in the areas of work that APDEP is involved in, I want you to join APDEP. You can do that by going to developmentforafrica.org. I want to salute the chairman. I want to salute organizers of LD and just say, let's continue to build the Black worker state. Uhuru. Uhuru, uhuru. Thank you so much, comrade director, Dr. Aisha. I'm getting all the I'm getting all the titles in there. Comrade director, Dr. Aisha Fields for that presentation and uh, really helping to show our people like what we are doing, um, you know, to to build the infrastructure to support, you know, agricultural development, healthcare development, and educational development. And you know what you know, really looking at what more can be done when we have more Africans who are dedicated to building the African worker state involved in this process. So I just really want to appreciate you um, and this presentation and contributing to the African Liberation Day program. We do have a section for questions and answers, but I want to just uh, uh, encourage our people who are watching. If you've liked what you've heard so far during this program, and you want to join the African Revolution. We tell you to join the African Revolution, go to apspuhuru.org slash join and complete the contact form. Let us know who you are, why you want to be a part of this work. Tell us, you know, rededicate yourself if you have dedicated yourself before to the, the, the mission of building, you know, a, a, a liberated uh, Africa and African people, building an African worker state building um you know uh self-governance for ourselves and destroying uh you know as a method of destroying the capitalist colonialism and its oppression on our people so um so i just again want to thank comrade aisha for your contributions to this program and encourage others to uh you know uh become members of the african people socialist party or and or i'm just gonna say and <laughs> Uh, become members of the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project by going to development for Africa. All everything is spelled out. Dot org. So right now we'll take about ten minutes in Q and A, and to take all your questions that are coming in. If you are on Zoom, you can use the Q and A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. And then if you're on YouTube and Facebook, please post your questions in the comment section. And, um, and then our moderators who are in those chats will take your questions and share them with us. So I'm gonna take a look at our discussion right now to see if we have any questions. I don't see any at the moment. So Comrade Aisha, if there's anything that you wanna deepen in terms of your presentation, uh, please continue to do that. If there's some area that you wanna really impress upon the people who are watching us. Uhuru, yeah, thank you. Um, Comrade Yejide, I, I think the um, thing maybe that I could say uh, is that you know, I really want to call on African people to recognize that we have a responsibility um, and that African uh, people, right now I'm speaking to African people specifically who have, uh, who have had access to kind of skills that, um, that needs to continue to build our work. I'm calling on African medical professionals, nurses, doctors, um, other medical uh, professionals, I'm talking right now to engineers, I'm talking right now to, um, you know, teachers and folks who have development related skills, agriculturalists, farmers, um, to really consider how your skills are being used right now, you know, to really think about whether or not you are pleased with the conditions that African people around the world have been forced to live under and um, whether or not you are playing the part, the maximum, you know, part that you can play overturning those conditions. And I think one of the powerful things that about the African People's Socialist Party is one, one of the things that 
brought me to this organization um, is the fact that uh, we have taken the responsibility not just to explain the world, which was very, very, very important for me at a time when I met the party because I was very un unclear about how I knew something about the history of Africa. I knew that I was an African and I had a responsibility to African people, but I did not really understand, couldn't put together how it was that everywhere African people are, we're experiencing the worst kind of conditions everywhere, you know? And it was the party that helped me to understand, it helped me, helped me to understand the question of colonialism, um, you know, the question of African people being dominated and Africa's resources being used to develop the white world at the expense of Africa and African people. Um, but beyond helping me to understand the world, the thing that has kept me in the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhura movement as long as, as I've been here is the fact that, uh, that, it's, that we really have the responsibility and have taken on the responsibility under the leadership of our chairman to change the world. And that's what you have an opportunity to do as a member of the Uhura movement and specifically with those kind of skills as members of APDEP. So I wanna call on on, on, on folks to join this organization and you, and you can do that by going to developmentforafrica.org. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Comrade. We do have some questions that are coming in. Uh, our first question comes from Sai Kamba, who's watching us on Facebook. And uh, Sai asks, how can someone start a community garden under APDEP? Thank you for that question, Comrade Sai. And the first thing is to join APDEP. Um, join APDEP and if your interest is to build a community garden, uh, what we can do is we can help you to establish uh, a local APDEP branch or a local um, APDEP community garden committee that can serve as the leadership uh, for that community garden and help you to identify you know, where that garden can be, whether or not there might be skills in that committee already, or if we need to identify you know, local forces or international forces who can help uh, provide the skills that we need. But the first step, is to join APDEP. And from there, uh, we can we can help you to make it happen. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for their response, um, Director Aisha. Our next question comes from uh, Hajar Logan from YouTube. The question is, can we be religious and join the African People's Socialist Party? Well, <laughs> can we be religious? Um, I believe that um, the, that Yes, we can have religious beliefs and join the African People's Socialist Party, certainly. But I think that um, part of what the African People's Socialist Party helps us understand is that, um, is that we have a responsibility to look at the world as it is and that our condition as a people uh, is not based on uh, the fact that we have or have not embraced certain religious ideas uh, and that uh, we are, as an organization, materialists. Um, and uh, we believe that uh, it's through, you know, um, investigating society that we learn how to change society. And so, um, and, and there are people who have joined African People's Socialist Party uh, and maybe some who have not necessarily expressed their religious, um, you know, uh, leanings, but who recognize and can put those in the proper context and recognize that our responsibility uh, immediately is to solve the problem that we're confronted with as African people and to take uh, the resources that belong to us and change the conditions for us materially. And you can have religious ideas and do that. Although I do believe that as a member of the African People's Socialist Party, uh, your religious ideas might be challenged through the, you know, through the work and the theory of African internationalism, but feel free. And you most definitely can be a relig religious person and join the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. We have principles of unity that have nothing to do uh, with, with your uh, religious beliefs and everything to do with your responsibility that you're willing to take as an African person to overturn the contradictions that have been posed on African people. Well, I don't see any other additional questions, but I have one and it's gonna come out of left field maybe. But um, comrade, you know, we're talking about building the African worker state and, and in our party, we are preparing to govern. What is the vision for the Our African People's Development Empowerment Project in the scope of building the African Workers' State? Like, once we gain power, right? Like, what what function, um, you know, will this organization serve um, to deal with the issues that you know con the contradictions that colonialism has caused? Uh -huh. I appreciate that question, and um, this is something that Chairman has helped us to 
uh, understand too, I think in his most recent um, report to the plenary that we just had in February, second plenary to the seventh Congress of our party, Chairman helped us to understand that uh, part of the way APDEF should see itself is you know, a post colonial Africa, you know, where African, where we've established African uh, worker state that um, APDEF would, would essentially function as a ministry of empowerment and development. And um, that, that much like we are functioning now where we've taken the responsibility for growing our capacity to deal with the healthcare needs of the African nation, our healthcare programs where we've you know, been working on developing a greater capacity to be able to feed ourselves, you know, dealing with the question of, of food production, and with the question of education, I mean, the some of the basic functions of a government are to, you know, to deal with, you know, food, health, and education of its people. And so through the APDEP programs, we have the ability to harness the expertise that already exists in the African world right now towards fighting this struggle for African liberation and ultimately winning it and not having to come out on the other side scrambling to figure out how it is that we you know that we build our you know our agricultural sector how we build our healthcare sector but coming out on the other side you know uh as 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 cadre who are prepared to govern you know so um hopefully you know that answers your question comrade today thank you in addition to what you mentioned earlier in terms of the sister's question around religion and uh but your answer which is struggles may happen around that in the party and then maybe not so much in the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. Can you say a little deep in people's understanding about the difference between the two, the mass organization and the party's uh, structure? Uhuru. So the Uhuru movement um, is led by the African People's Socialist Party, which is chaired by Omali, Herman Omalia Shatela. The African People's Socialist Party is the parent you know, organization of APDEP, um, and of the other um, mass organizations that we've, you know, we will hear from today and that we've heard from yesterday, like ANWL, the International People's Democratic Uhura Movement. Um, at, uh, the, the party has established economic institutions that we heard uh, our deputy chair speak about yesterday. So the party has assumed responsibility for the whole revolutionary project, recognizing that in order to make revolution that you have to have organization of cadre, people who have made it their mission to do whatever is necessary to complete the African revolution to its successful conclusion. And um, those people who are prepared to be professional revolutionaries and have the kind of dedication um, necessary to, to make that a success are people who uh, join the African People's Socialist Party. And the party also recognizes though that in order to re make revolution, we have to be masses of African people to, to that position that revolution is necessary. And it also recognizes that everybody is not in the same political space at the same time. And that we have responsibility nonetheless to move the whole, you know, as many to galvanize and mobilize as many Africans and other people as possible towards that trajectory that the party is putting in us on. So the party has established organizations like App, like AMWO, like NPDOM, um, and other institutions that people can join and meet them where they are, you know, and that help to uh, give them an immediate role that they can play in uh, in uh, meeting the, the objectives of, of, of the party without necessarily being in the party. Um, and so, uh, and it, and we have principles of unity, for example, in APDEP, our principles of unity speak to the fact that you recognize that you're an African person, your skills don't belong to you as an African person, they belong to the nation, recognizing that, um, you know, the, the, the uh, resources of Africa belong to African people everywhere, you know, we're one African people, so they're just basic principles of unity that don't require you to be a, a revolutionary, to require you to be a socialist, uh, don't even require you to know what those things mean, but that through that through that process of participating in APDEP programs and political education is always happening and through the process of work and seeing that that it's not just what we say, but it's what we do <clears throat> can win us to a deeper understanding and unity with the party and may even win us to want to join and participate directly in the party. So 
the party is is, is and its strategy uh, is is really all encompassing. And there's a role for every <clears throat> African patriot, for every African religious or non-religious, uh, you know, uh, or wherever you are in old or young, wherever you are, to play a role in the, in the future that all African people want and, and um, that we should have. Thank you so much, Comrade uh, Director Dr. Aisha Fields, uh, for all of those answers to those questions. We are at time for the question and answer segment. So I just really want to appreciate you for your contributions to the African Liberation Day program and appreciate everybody who's been watching and commenting. There has been, there might not have been questions, but there have been comments that have come in uh, through our uh, platform. So I just appreciate you all for sharing and again. Uh, just encouraging everyone to answer the call to become a member of the African People's Socialist Party by starting your process by going to APSPUhuru.org slash join and also by donating, contributing your resources to this process by going to ALDUhuru.org slash donate to contribute to this process. And finally, to become a member of the African All African People's Development and Empowerment Project um, and join the work of Comrade Dr. Aisha Fields by going to developmentforafrica.org and becoming a member of that organization. So once again, Comrade Dr. Aisha Fields, thank you so much for uh, your contributions to this program. Thank you, Comrade Njide. Uh -huh. so next, I want to bring back up my comrade, uh, Comrade Alikia Ngoma to introduce our next segment. All right. Thank you, Yejide. Uh, once again, thank you, Comrade Aisha, uh, for your participation as well. Um, I'm going to be bringing back up again comrades Kingozi and comrade Basil to talk about economic self-reliance. Uhuru comrades. Uhuru. Uh -huh. We've had a few more donations come in. Um, we have Chimbaranga with another $25, uh, Michael Parker, $25, Sandra Forrest, $50, Matum um, Inyobi, $25, Maureen Wagner, $50, Zoe Franklin, $50, and NPDM, International People Democratic Uhuru Movement, $100. So that's a total of, that's $350. Added to the 1645, that's $1,995. So I will add another $5 to make it an even $2,000. We're still short of our goal, but I really appreciate all the donations. Um, continue to give if you can, uh, or join the African People's Socialist Party and uh, help us continue this fight. Thank you. Uhuru, thank you, Comrade Kengozi. Um, so next, we're going to bring to the program the party's mass organization in PIDUM, which stands for the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. Founded in 1991 by the African People's Socialist Party, in PIDUM is the leading organization in the struggle for bread, peace, and Black power in the 21st century. For the last 22 years, in PIDUM has fought courageously for the African community. NPDM has fought for community control, Black community control of education while protesting the budget cuts and school closures in our communities. NPDM has fought for justice for African victims of police brutality, such as Sean Bell, Oscar Grant, and Ori Jalo, who were burned to death in a police precinct in Germany. NPDM has defended the right for African people to resist colonial oppression as when, uh, as NPDM did when Lovell Mixon killed four cops in Oakland, California in 2009. It was NPDM who led the defense of the heroic African youth in London, UK, after they set the city ablaze in response to the police murder of Mark Dugan. Now located in, in three continents around the world, NPDM has always 
demanded reparations, state power, and self-government for African people worldwide. And Peter knows that politicians in City Hall and the White House will never fight for Black power to the African community. And Peter knows that it takes revolutionary organization to protect and defend our own, wherever we may be, whoever we may be. Welcome, comrades, to the program. Uhuru, please introduce yourselves and help our un audience understand what problems caused by capitalism is in Pedum dismantling and how are we solving these contradictions to forward the African worker state. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru comrades. Just, oh, okay. Uhuru. Um, my name is President Kalumbayi Antoinette. And um, this is the International People Democratic Uhuru Movement Report. I just really want to salute this dynamic ALD and all the presenters before me. Um, and just say what a splendid party. This is just has been amazing. Um, I really want to start off by um, next slide. I really would like to start off by saluting my leadership. Um, you know, Chairman Amalia Shatella, the African People's Socialist Party's leadership and the leadership of the African nation. Just really want to um, salute Chairman um, for building the International People Democratic Uhuru Movement as a strategy um, for the revolution, um, knowing that the masses of people had to be able to have its own vehicle to be able to understand their own struggle um, for the African working class. And also I have to um, really salute and appreciate um, Deputy Chair Onizene Yeshitela, um, as well, had, that has poured so much um, into EPDOM. Um, she always started off by saying that she joined EPDOM before she was in the party. And she is responsible for a, a lot of our mandates, our, how we operate, um, um, and things like that. So we really wanted to make sure that we salute Deputy Chair Onizene Yeshitela. Next slide. Um, the International People Democratic Ahura Movement, EPDOM. Um, EPDOM is a, the door uh, for the masses to come into political life. One of the last questions that was asked, you know, if you religious, um, is it a place for you in the Ahura Movement? And yes, uh, when I met the movement, I was a, a Christian. I was an evangelist, licensed evangelist. Um, I was out with Mike Brown, I was murdered and met Chairman Amalia Shatella. And most mass, um, most of our people, no matter where we are in the globe, um, have the only thing that we have to explain our um, life and uh, the contradictions that we face every single day is usually from um, a Bible or you know uh, the the Holy Quran or some spiritual thing. But this do not help us have science um, and how to have strategy um, to understand exactly what we face every single day. Why do the community look like this? Why is Africa being looted? Um, why is the um, neo-colonial puppets are in place? And EPDOM brings the masses back into political life and really deepen our understanding and not only bring us back into political life, but take us um, beyond just being people that things happen to, but actually involve in a struggle to overturn um, the oppression that we face every single day with all of our various different campaigns of African short genocide, reparations, we're even running people for political office, um, town hall meetings, wherever the masses are, we are. Next slide. EPDOM um, from the, you know, the, you know, EPDOM, the character of EPDOM, um, the political line, all of it is because we work under the leadership of a revolutionary party. So the African People's Socialist Party is a vanguard party and EPDOM is a mass organization under the leadership of the party. That is very important because we don't just come up with our own um, strategy, but the strategy comes from a revolutionary um, party that has built a machine um, to fight against the oppression that we face everywhere in the world. Again, EPDOM is an international organization because we understand that African people have to connect our fight we have to know that what's happening in South Africa, in Ghana, in New York, St. Louis, Missouri, wherever we are, it's the same oppression. And we have to overturn it by coming back into political life and actually understand how to govern ourselves. 
We learn bad behaviors under this social system. We learn to come to work late. We learn that you know we don't have um, uh, the, the proper tools and things that we learn in school. And so coming back into political life, we train um, um, the African working class to take themselves serious, to be, to understand what it means to be self-governed um, and build contending in dual power. And so um, the next slide, I really want to, next, um, I, and these are just some of the various different campaigns. The Congress that's coming behind me is the international IEC that I really want to salute because all the work that we do happen from an international level of executive committee that um, oversees all of our international work, providing leadership on every front and all of them are prepared to answer the same question of how the area of work that they do speaks to um, how we are going to bring the African working class back into political life and bring them into the great, the great party, the Vanguard party. Next slide. And so uh, with that being said, I am very excited to salute this revolutionary giant, Eni Pidam, um, our vice president um, uh, out of San Diego, uh, Comrade Masamela Odom, Uhuru. Uh, Uhuru Prez, and, and thank you for that. I, I'm really, really uh, 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 honored to be here. I want to salute the party for its revolutionary uh, uh, strategy for um, uh, making uh, African Liberation Day uh, uh, an, an anti-colonial struggle, part of our anti-colonial struggle. Impedum is an anti-colonial organization. I'm uh, Matamela Odom. I'm an international vice president of Impedum, the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. Change slides. I would like to salute the leadership of Chairman Omalia Yashitela, the leader of the International African Revolution and the founder of the Uhuru Movement. I'd like to salute DC Ona uh, 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 and her place in the economic at the, at the center of all the work we do. I would like to salute all the leaders of the Central Committee of the APSP. I would also like to salute President Colin Bae, my president. I wanna thank her for her trust and her leadership. Change slides. Cool. Um, uh, in this report, uh, I would like to address the prompt uh, uh, talking, of, uh, talking about Impedum as a revolutionary strategy of the African People's Socialist Party to bring Africans into political life. Our organization is the complete embodiment of the answer to this question. In founding the APSP, uh, the, the African internationalism and the, the 14 port platform of the APSP, Chairman Omaya Shatella has made the crucial intervention into revolutionary theory and practice that will lead all our uh, all, all people to true liberation. Uh, that is what we acknowledge today. Under the leadership of Chairman, uh, we know that colonialism is the mode of production. It was colonialism that produced capitalism and not the other way around. This is because it was colonialism that turned Africa, quote, into a warrant for the commercial hunting of black skins, unquote, rendering Africans the pedestal on which uh, 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 the European and white North American nation, the entire white nation uh, uh, and all its wealth is built. Change slides. Well, I'm here to ask you today, what happens when that pedestal rises up? I'll tell you what happens, white power falls, colonialism crumbles. And Pedum brings the African working class into political life. And Pedum wages anti-colonial struggle. This was true in IET in 1791. This was true 200 years later in Chicago in 1991 when Impedum was created under the leadership of the APSP. Change slides. In 1977, Chairman Omali Eshetela outlined the, the role of revolutionary leadership in mass movements in the pamphlet, the political aspects of building a mass movement in, in the tactical and strategic objectives uh, uh, the tactical and strategic objectives for Black liberation. I find this incredibly instructive for answering the question today. Strategic object, the strategic objectives of a mass movement are one: win Black people to the uh, uh, political position, uh, to the position of political independence. Two: establish the um, uh, 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 leadership of the pro-independence movement. Three, win support for the independence position within the US 
current borders. Uh, uh, next, uh, the creation of dual and contending power. Uh, after that, win international support for the independence position. Lastly, build an African People's Liberation Army, as we talked about earlier today, as Chairman talked about in reference to Kaunda, who said the first thing was to build the bank, and the Arab comrade said the first thing was for us to build is a blood bank. Uh, 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 chairman made these arguments almost 45 years ago in the spring of 1977, and this has guided the work of the Huru movement, ushered the creation of Impedum, and informs all the reports you'll hear today. You, uh, uh, next slide. First, so first off, how are we winning Black people to political life? In the outreach report, you hear about Impedum's mass campaigns. Uh, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, so yeah, so you hear about Impedum's mass campaigns, Black Lives Matter, African Star Genocide, President Colin Baez campaign. Next slide. Uh, 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 Impedum is establishing a, a, a leadership of the pro-independence uh, 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 a, a, a movement. We can see this in our InfoNet strategies and our outreach uh, programs and membership and recruitment, economic development. Next slide. So uh, 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 we're winning the support uh, 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 of, 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 of independence uh, uh, within U.S. current borders. Next slide. Um, and, uh, and Pedum is 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 um, is is doing this by waging ideological struggle. You know, uh, uh, winning the war of ideas. Uh, um, we see the creation of dual and contending power by by way of Impedum, as well as by way of building uh, uh, offices that become economic incubators. Next slide. Uh, 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 so we know that uh, uh, politics are concentrated economics. Uh, next slide. Winning international support for the international independence. Impedum is an international organization with members as far from where I sit in California to Southern Africa, all the way up to Europe, throughout uh, across both colonial borders in North America. Impedum holds fraternal bond with anti-colonial Mexican revolutionary organization Union de Barrio. We proudly yell "Free, free Palestine." Next slide. We also. Uh, uh, do this for, uh, by fulfilling the party's regional strategy. Next slide. Impedum is building a, a, a is building um, uh, is, is recruiting for the African Revolution. Next slide. So I want to once again just acknowledge Impedum's 30th anniversary uh, uh, and the Revolutionary Party uh, uh, project of the party uh, and say that uh, uh, Impedum is recruiting for the African Revolution. We're recruiting everyone out there. We're recruiting you. Ooh. Next slide. Next slide. Now, uh, let me pass it to Comrade Fofi. Ahuru, ahuru. Uh, thank you, VP Masimela Odom. I am Fofi Dakibulan International, International People Democratic Uhuru Movement Economic Development Coordinator. Next slide. I want to salute my leadership. I would like to salute uh, Chairman Omali Yeshitela, leader of the National Afri African Nation, Deputy Chair Ona Zene Yeshitela, leader of the Uhuru Movement Economic Work, President Columba Yandanet, International President of the International People Democratic Movement, and Vice President Masamela Odom, who is the Vice President of Impedum International, um, Impedum People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. Next slide. Uzi. Uzi Custom Apparel is a customary revolutionary clothing company that put revolution, revolutionary saying on the backs and front of our customers. This starts the conversation of revolution and bring the masses to political life. Uzi began as an became an LLC under the leadership of Black Star Industries from the mandate of the 2020 plenary report. Uzi is the economic institution of the Impedum to support its campaigns, programs, and a special goal of employing full-time revolutionary and supporting our leadership. Now, let's watch a quick Uzi video. Next. Ooh. 
Uzi Custom Apparel is a customizing revolutionary style clothing line that serves as the economic development institution for the international people democratic Uhuru movement, NPDOM. NPDOM is a mass organization of the Uhuru movement created by the African People's Socialist Party to win Africans to self-determination. In 2020, Uzi Customer Power became an LLC and a subsidiary of Black Star Industries with the mission to influence African people to be self-determined with revolutionary teaching through the clothes and articles we sell and lessons we teach with each purchase of Uzi product. We want to make Uzi Custom Apparel an international brand by putting revolution on the backs, minds, and in closets of the African nation until all Africans are free. Uzi means thread in Swahili. In the Uhuru movement, we call it a thread of freedom to promote freedom and to build economic development in African communities worldwide. Uzi was entrusted to Impedum to create dual and contending power, to enable Impedum to become a part of the people we serve and offer revolutionary style. Uzi offered the African working class artistic, crafty, and creative ways to show pride in being African and why it's important to not just buy Black, but to buy Black power. Uzi Custom Apparel offers the African community their revolutionary voice on their jackets, t-shirts, dresses, and pants. Every Uzi purchase is unique. No design is identical, which is why we are Uzi Custom Apparel. The fashion industry is the most wasteful industry in the world. Styles change every season. The competition is fierce and wasteful among the colonial industries. Uzi takes gently used clothing and refreshes, refurbish, and restyle them for affordable pricing to the African community. Uzi promotes sustainability and is good for the environment by recycling reused items and placing them back into the hands of the people. What does Uzi Custom Apparel becoming an LLC mean to us? This offers a continuous economic stream to employ revolutionaries. We can buy wholesale and take advantage of business programs. The LLC status will give us the opportunity to grow our brand and business online to reach more Africans worldwide. Uzi has plans to open an Uzi store on the ground in St. Louis by 2022. We can truly become an African international clothing line, giving us the power to have Uzi in Africa, the Caribbean islands, England and everywhere African people are. We want to be the preferred choice over parasitic capitalist overpriced clothing and underpaid workers. Uzi represents the African revolution and puts revolution on the backs of all our customers. In other words, it is revolutionary custom apparel. Support Uzi Custom Apparel and bring Uzi to a country, town, or city near you. Uzi is into you. Next slide. It is very important that Uzi belongs to the people. Under the leadership of the party, we need to build a mass movement under Uzi for the masses to participate in a revolutionary clothing line. Next slide. It is a strategy and a form of self-determination. Uzi is into you because it is you are the people. Attached with the mandates to build offices means that Uzi is in the heart of the African community. It depends on understanding, it deepens the understanding of self-determination by the masses participating in work, build 
confidence, knowing that they can start their own businesses. These skills are not in the community, but we train these skills at Uzi. Next slide. Support Uzi Custom Apparel. And our next slide. I would like to bring to you my comrade of, of Impedum Outreach Coordinator, Comrade Muwambi Tango. Uhuru, Uhuru, Uhuru. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation, Kofi. Um, so let's go ahead and hit the next slide. Uhuru, so first of all, I wanna go ahead and salute my leadership, Chairman Amalia Shetela, the leader of the Global African Socialist Revolution. And I'm honored to be a member of the African People's Socialist Party and on the International Executive Committee of Impedum. Salute Secretary General Louise Kinshasa. Salute Deputy Chair Ona Zene Yeshitela. I wanna salute President Colin Bailly and appreciate your undying love for the revolutionary process and the science of African internationalism. Salute to VP Matsamela and my regional leadership, Bakri Olatunji, who has continued to endure the test of time. And PEDEM Outreach is engaged in a rigorous process to bring, bring our international office to the level of organization that not only reaches the masses in the streets, but also utilizes technology to reach the African world in areas we may not exist. Slide. The, African, the Africans Charge Genocide campaign is a primary campaign of PEDEM. Last year, we saw a massive surge of support on the petition around this time in African Liberation Day. This was the same day George Floyd was murdered by the state and the masses broke out of the confines of the quarantine and flooded the streets in every corner of not only the US, but all over the world. During this period, over 100,000 people signed the ACG petition, answering the call to charge the United States of America with genocide against the African people. Slide. The African reparations claim has been an amazing campaign that has, taken, that has been taken on by Impedum last year. The African reparations claim gives Africans the ability to say, to have a say so in the struggle for reparation. Point 11 of the African People's Socialist Party 14 point platform says, we want the US and the international European ruling class and, the, and state to pay Africa and African people for the centuries of genocide of oppression and enslavement of our people. The African reparations claim is a vehicle that will unite the masses of the African nation to make this a reality. We are using technology that we have at our disposal and our African working class genius to reach the African masses wherever we are at so that every African can make their claim for reparation. On our road to the convention, we are calling for all Impedum members. I repeat, we are calling for all Impedum members to set up tables with the African reparations claim everywhere we're at. We have to make this claim accessible to the masses of African people. I also wanna call on all of us to start knocking on doors. Door to door wins the war. And we learned this in St. Louis. The question of reparations for the African nation needs to be heard from the synagogue to the church, from the dance halls to the pool hall, from the streets to the campuses. Black people need to have this campaign in their hands. Next slide. Impedum has worked tirelessly to implement the regional strategy. The regional strategy increases our capacity to keep the work accountable. It gives us the ability to build in areas even if there's one person. That one person is no longer alone because now they are attached to the whole region. The, re the party is the leadership of Impedum and the regional strategy allows Impedum to have the party impose its directives, mandate, and make sure that they're being carried out wherever there's Impedum branches or Impedum members. Next slide. The broadsheet. Now the broadsheet was an amazing strategy that was implemented because it brought skills to the African working class. In St. Louis, we had 10,000 copies of a four sheet newspaper that were distributed throughout the 21st and third war. It taught us how to create, create a budget. Colin Bailly was the editor in chief for the first time. And by getting the neighborhood involved, it was able to provide resources to a community who's normally pushed into illegal means to gain resources. We were able to form life-changing relationships and inform the community through the broadsheet. 
It was a strategy that really taught us how to cover a wide space. Next slide. And we wanna salute the African People's Socialist Party for this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant strategy of entering the electoral arena in St. Louis. Running two candidates, attacking the neo-colonial leadership in two different wards, put the system on their heels. And Peterman was able to participate by running our international president and it changed our style of organization. Through this campaign, we gained an understanding that certain processes have to be added to our work. We were able to build our database. We were able to build a real social movement and have an on, on the ground campaign that spoke to the masses in St. Louis. Next slide. In this campaign, we saw the impact of the science of African internationalism. The St. Louis newly elected mayor, who is an African woman, Tashara Jones, was impacted. And we see it in her rhetoric and even how she addresses things like reparation. And the entire alderman race was centered around the issues that Tachara and President Columbine brought to the table. And it changed how St. Louis deals with politics forever. We need to continue to bring African internationalist politics into this arena. We need to be in town hall meetings, neighborhood associations. We need to challenge the neo-colonialists and take up all the political space we can. We need to deepen our commitment to, our, to getting our democratic right. And we were able to gain this through this. So now I wanna introduce Dexter Mlamwingu, M who's our, inter our international info and ed coordinator to show us how he brought his amazing revolutionary skills to impede him, Uhuru. Uhuru. Three, three minutes left, three minutes left. Uhuru, Uhuru. Yeah, I really wanna appreciate the introduction from Comrade Mwambi. And I want to salute uh, the leadership of Chairman Mali Shatella and the African People's Socialist Party and this whole African Liberation Day event. So let's get into it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my name is Dexter Lewingo, and I'm the uh, Information Education Coordinator for Impedum. <clears throat> and I really want to salute the uh, salute ALD's call to create the African worker state. Now, uh, in order to create the African worker state, we have to make the African revolution. And in order to make the African revolution, we got to win the masses of our people to revolution. And we accomplish this by winning the war of ideas. That's the, uh, the ideas of the oppressor versus the ideas of the oppressed. <clears throat> and we have to educate uh, people on the conditions we live in, the root of those conditions, and the solution to fixing those conditions. And that's the responsibility of the Office of Info and Ed. Next slide, please. The role of Info and Ed is to spread the theory of African internationalism throughout our communities. And one of the primary ways we do that is through distributing the Burning Spear newspaper. We've recently made a push for our branches to create lists of local stores in their communities that we can approach about making the burning spear available in their stores. This is important because there are multiple news organs out there and they all have a bunch of things to say, but none of them are bringing our people toward our liberation. The burning spear newspaper has to be just as easily accessible as, as these other news organs, if not more accessible. And through this process, we deepen our presence in our communities. And Peter and the burning spear newspaper become key figures in our community. We also show the various store owners that they can make resources to sustain themselves by spreading African internationalism in their communities. And this helps to bring them closer to us and deepen their unity with African internationalism. InfoNet has also conducted regular Burning Spear writers trainings that teach people how to write in the style of the Burning Spear in front of the perspective of the African working class community. Next slide. This is why we have the African Resistance Now column in the Burning Spear newspaper. We give the African working class a platform to express themselves and tell their own stories using their own voice. This is what distinguishes ARN from the other media out there. In 2021, we featured numerous pieces of poetry and other expressions, cultural expressions of our people. We gave an African internationalist breakdown of the late DMX and its significance to our community. And we reported on the uprisings in Minneapolis since the George Floyd police murder and interviewed our very own President Columbia, who led impeding forces on the ground in Minneapolis during the Derek Chauvin verdict. As a strategy to recruit more writers to impede them in African resistance now, we've taken our articles and converted them to pamphlets, as, as you see here, to be distributed throughout our communities. And with each pamphlet, we have a call to subscribe to the Burning Spirit newspaper on them and a call to join impede them and become a writer for African resistance now. Next slide. In 2021, um, Comrade Mwambi spoke a little to this, we are honored to work on the historic Cardoza Bentham Alderperson campaign in St. Louis. We created palm cards, flyers, yard signs, posters, banners, and buttons, uh, videos for this dynamic campaign, as well as a free broadsheet that broke down all the issues facing our community in St. Louis, explained the root of the issues, and gave the solution to those issues. 
We spread the brush throughout the St. Louis community and it really helped up people to understand our own conditions. It was important for Imperium to participate in this campaign because it gave us the opportunity to use the electoral process to highlight the issues plaguing our communities put in place by the system using the big platform that these campaigns provide. And this enabled us to expose the entire city of St. Louis and beyond to our movement and ultimately make about 1,000 new contacts. Next slide, please. So Imperium has a responsibility to bring all African and colonized people back into political life. And one of the most crucial groups of Africans who need to be organized are our brothers and sisters locked up behind bars. So in 2021, we began a process of engaging Africans in prison. We begin with sending letters, introducing ourselves, saying what Impedum is and what our mission is, and, um, <clears throat> and invite them to subscribe to the Burning Spear newspaper. Then we follow up with political education in the form of literature, like our membership brochure and the ARN pamphlets. And uh, we encourage African prisoners to communicate with us through letters or other uh, different cultural pieces that we could feature in African Resistance Now or the Burning Spear newspaper in general. In the two months since we began this program, we received three letters from incarcerated Africans and have recruited two to impede them. Ahuru. Ahuru, Comrade Ahuru. Dexter, I, I think that's our time. This has been an amazing report. I just want to be um, mindful of the time. So I wanted to see if the program could let us know if we should continue or if we can just hold this until maybe um, the Q&A. But thank you, Comrade Dexter, for that amazing How much um, more time report. Time? How much more time will you need? Dexter report is the last report and we'll be done. Yeah. Okay, let, let's finish. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Thank you, President. Yeah, so um, we received three uh, letters and recruited two Africans in prisons to uh, impede them. And this is just the beginning. Uh, in the coming months, we'll be working alongside the membership office to improve this whole process uh, with the goal being to, to be in the creation of entire branches of impede operating in the belly of the beast. And this is all part of Impedium carrying out its responsibility to recruit every single African back into political life. So I wanna make a call right now for everyone viewing this program uh, who knows somebody locked down that you wanna get involved with this organization to email us at info at impedium.org. That's info at impedium.org. You can also comment in the Zoom, um, in the Facebook, YouTube, however you're viewing it, you can comment down if you have somebody in mind and I'll make sure to follow up with you. So, um, so through these processes, uh, through circulating the burning spirit in our communities, to, to winning uh, store owners in our communities and winning riders in our communities and engaging, engaging African prisoners. These are just some of the ways that we bring the masses of African people to organization and a revolutionary conclusion. And that's how Impedium contributes to building the African worker state. So at this point, I just want to salute this African Liberation Day mobilization again. I want to salute the leadership of Chairman Amalia Chatella. I want to salute my direct leadership, uh, President Kalambayi. And I want to move it on to Vice President Masumela Odom. Uhuru. Uhuru, uh, so that, that, that concludes our report. We'll go back to President Chalambay. Uhuru, Uhuru. Um, I just really want to say that um, thank you um, for the opportunity to be able to lead an amazing um, work. The International People Democratic Uhuru Movement changed the life of African people. Being equipped with a theory helped you to understand that you're not cursed. It wasn't just bad luck. It wasn't just some bad decisions that we made as African people while we experienced this horrific um, conditions that we face with, no matter if we in Africa or in the US or on an island. The theory helped you to be able to sum up and explain your conditions and not only explain it or sum it up, but actually be a part of destroying the thing that sits on our future, on our kids' future. So I consider the honor to serve in this capacity and really want to salute again, my leadership, Chairman Amala Yeshatella, for understanding that the African working class had to have a vehicle of equip and change our reality. Thank you, Uhuru. Uhuru. Uh, let me get this. Okay, there we go. Uhuru, thank you, President uh, Kalambayi, International President of NPIDAM, as well as all of the comrades who has present, uh, presented. 
Comrade Matsumela Odom, uh, Comrade Fofit Muandi Tengu, and Dexter, uh, thank you for your participations in uh, this program so far. And so now we are actually just going to go to um, uh, to have in PDM's Economic Development Project, Uzi Custom Clothing, to bring you an opportunity to support the work, which you know that uh, Uzi Custom Clothing is an economic development project of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. So besides joining in PDM and becoming a member, uh, you can also support Uzi as another way of supporting in PDM, Uhuru. Uhuru, Uzi, we excited. So the International People Democratic Uhuru Movement, um, at the Office of Deputy Chair Owner Zanaya Shatella, some years ago, um, her office came up with a whole, laid out a whole plan of Uzi. Um, Uzi is a Swahili word, it means a thread. And we like to say a thread of freedom. And she, she presented this to um, myself and the international office as a way for us to get off the treadmill and have a way for us to be able to fund our movement and bring the African working class to be able to feed clothing. House itself is in pieces. So one of the things that we've been concentrating on is to build the Uzi um, committee and um, also to be able to brand um, now that we are LLC under um, Black Store Industry, which we are so excited about where we worked in Deputy Chair's office and her whole office to make this be a reality. And this is amazing. So let's start off with first thing we have is um, our Uzi buttons. These buttons are um, two for $5 and one for three. Two for um, $5, one for three. And this is item. one African shore genocide is number two um the black power matter in black is number three and the black power matters in white is four our African wrist candy we really want to appreciate all of our furniture stores and um our uh that carry our um bracelets our African wrist candy they always ordering for us and we getting our merch in more stores um as well and this is our African wrist candy. So this one right here um, has an energy stone that is, what's the name of it? Just real quickly. Unikite. Unikite. And Unikite is um, a stone for transformation. And as we know, no rep, nobody is born a revolutionary. We are transformed and made into revolutionaries coming under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. So this is item F. So if you're interested in this, this is item F. So F and it's ten dollars. This is the next one. Um, it has the uh, clear glass beads. Oh, sorry, clear glass beads on there with um, wood. Very, very pretty. This is E item E. This is D. This is item D. Okay, and. I'm sorry, <laughs> let me, this is item A. This is item A and it's red, black and green, okay? So these are energy stones in there as well. As we know, the green is for our land. So I use the energy stone that is about prosperity and then, um, which is jade. And then we have the red, uh, which is the red is for fire. And then the black, um, we know is for um, uh, black people. And this particular stone is one that you can put oils in as well so there you go and these are all ten dollars and that's all for the bracelets and we're going to move on to our uzi merch okay so this is item what what number so this is our um this is a crop top it's a tank top and it's uzi and gold and it says a thread of freedom at the bottom 
So you're going to see a lot of things with our branding. You got to get your Uzi top. It's so cute. This is $20, item five, item five. These are our leggings and Uzi is a custom um, clothing line. So I just want to let you know that you can go to Uzi custom um, cuts and you, you can um, have your leggings that you have around the house um, done up by us as well. These are tie dye. They were actually um, green first and then they were tie dye. So these are leggings. This is an item. Uh, these are a 2X and it's $20 and it's item six. These are um, like the joggers with the hammer, the hammer pants kind of like the, and it got the stretchy and their leggings. Really, really cool looking with pockets. I love pockets. These are $20. These are a size medium. These are a size medium. And they are um, item seven for $20. Item seven for $20. I love these dresses. They don't do, they don't do me well, but you know, with the no top at the, and this is tie dyed as well. A Uzi dress is long. And this is, it says um, it's a size medium. This is a size medium number eight for $35. This is a Uzi jumpsuit. Um, it has the Uzi custom, uh, Uzi thread of freedom at the bottom of it. It's a jumpsuit, it's pants, short sleeve, very um, comfortable material. This is a size large and it is beautiful y'all. I love it and it has pockets. Just wanna say that it has pockets too. This is item nine for $35. Item 10 for 30. The size is a size um, extra large. This is an extra large dress, really comfortable. Number a number 11 for $35. That was number 11 for $35. This is a beautiful just t shirt in black, thread of freedom, nice unisex for anyone. And this is a large, and this is item 12 for $25. Item 12 for $25. I absolutely love this. This is, I always try to make sure we have all different sizes. This right here is a 2X. It's a 2X. It has the um, knitted sleeves right here. You can add things like that to your sleeves um, with Uzi. We can custom that for you. And then it says Uzi with the silver with black. And it says a thread of freedom. And this is item, this is item 13 for $25. Comrade Kalambayi, can you hear us? Uh -huh. Uh -huh, I'm not sure. Um, well, I'm not sure what, uh, the, I'm sure, well, I see that there's technical difficulties happening during the live sales portion of the program. I'm gonna to continue to talk for a few minutes to see if, if we can get them reconnected so that they can finish out their live sales vending. If that doesn't happen, then we'll just move the program along to our summation part of the program and thank uh, the comrades from MPDOM for, um, for the presentation that they just gave and all the work that they are doing to build and contribute to building the African worker state and also for their in-depth overview of Uzi and then us seeing the fruits of their labor with the live cells and the products that they have that are carrying out with Uzi. So um, it looks like uh, that we are can't resolve the technical difficulties and we can 
move the program forward. So again, I just want to thank those comrades who uh, participated, comrades Kalambayi, comrades Masamela, Muambi Tangu, Dexter Mwilingu, and uh, comrade uh, uh, Pofi uh, from MPDM's International Executive Committee, Uhuru comrades. So finally, I want to um, thank uh, everybody who participated in this segment with all of your questions and comments. And now we're gonna move the agenda forward to introduce our chairman once again to the program uh, to sum up uh, the African Liberation Day, the work that we're doing to build the African worker state. So welcome chairman back to our program, Uhuru Comrade. Uhuru Comrade, uh, President Yejide. First of all, I wanna thank you uh, for the incredible job that you and all of the other persons in the party who uh, work to coordinate this uh, process and make this African Liberation Day uh, occur for us for the last uh, two days. Uh, it's been uh, really uh, important. And I think in terms of uh, summing up uh, what the party is doing uh, to create the African worker state, I think uh, the two days have spoken for themselves. Uh, we've heard incredible reports uh, from uh, different leaders of our movement. Uh, we've seen uh, the fact that the party is not just an organization that talks about something that for us, African Liberation Day, is not just some empty uh, symbol, uh, but it is a part of the project uh, for uh, the liberation of our Africa. We really believe in and uh, the, uh, the question of the liberation of our Africa, the unification of our Africa and African people globally. So that's what we are about. And that's what this African Liberation Day mobilization was about as well. I want to remind everybody that uh, as part of this project to build uh, the African worker state that uh, in 2023, uh, the African People's Socialist Party will be holding our first international Congress. We hold Congresses uh, frequently uh, within the United States right now. Uh, we're constitutionally bound to do it every five years. At one time, it was every three years. Uh, and we've just uh, in 2020 ended our seventh Congress uh, but now we will have uh, our first international Congress that's going to be in South Africa or Occupy the Zania. This is going to be an extremely uh, significant. It's going to be a historical event. And, and perhaps more than anything that we've done in a very long time, it's going to contribute to uh, the struggle to build the African worker state. We expect uh, African people from throughout uh, the world uh, to come to this Congress, and we expect uh, that uh, especially from the continent of Africa, people will make every effort and will be coming by every means possible uh, to get, get to uh, South Africa or occupy the Zania, <clears throat> where we will be holding this Congress. And when we, we've talked uh, so much and you've seen and heard all of the presentations that's come from our party showing the, the different doors that we've opened up for people uh, to participate in the African revolution, showing how critical we uh, believe the participation of the African working class and the masses of African people uh, is uh, to, uh, to making this, uh, bringing this uh, worker state to fruition. We've talked about how uh, uh, it is absolutely necessary if we recognize that we are oppressed, that we have to recognize there's an oppressor. And this oppressor is something that we call colonialism. I'll say a few things about that uh, moving forward. And that you have to have, uh, uh, to end it, you have to have an organization. It's, a, it's a, a, a different kind of organization. Just any kind of organization won't suffice if we're going to end uh, this relationship we have with our oppressor. And we're talking about an oppressor is the most powerful uh, military and political force on the planet Earth, headquartered in the United States. And so you just can't do any kind of organization to get rid of it. Uh, it takes a special kind of organization. And some people refer to it as a vanguard organization. It's an organization of cadre uh, that's, uh, that's dedicated uh, to, uh, to end this relationship. That's, their profession is to make this revolution uh, to, to, uh, to free our people. And they have committed themselves to the process of revolution and not just to uh, the excitement of the moment uh, that might make somebody want to go out and protest this or protest that. And they understand that uh, uh, that genuine revolution means the absolute uh, overturning, the absolute destruction of the 
ability of the oppressor to oppress us and to replace that repression with our own liberated capacity. That liberated capacity is the African people's worker state, the African worker state. That's what we're talking about. I want to share with you uh, just briefly uh, this uh, a, a part of a presentation that was made by uh, by me uh, at our uh, 2017 uh, uh, plenary to uh, our Congress. And, and, and this 2017 plenary, uh, we talked about uh, some things about what it means, what it will mean for African and African people to be free in the African worker state. And here, here's just something I want to read from that, uh, because we're not just talking about freedom in some kind of abstract way. Uh, freedom and justice, things like that are pure abstractions if they are not uh, connected to the question of the achievement of actual power in the hands of the oppressed. Uh, so we said in this political report uh, to the 2017 uh, 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 plenary of the African People's Socialist Party, uh, there will be no forced idleness under post-liberated socialist construction in Africa and abroad. The work to build adequate infrastructure, housing and schools to electrify our cities and countryside, to grow food and purify our water and eradicate disease and the deadly mosquito are just some of the tasks guaranteed to offer full employment for our people for years to come. This is productive labor that serves the people instead of bourgeois profit. This is productive labor that cannot happen under colonialist capitalism that grinds down and demoralizes the worker and humiliates the colonial subject. Capitalist production functions on the base of stolen lands and peoples. It is production that only pays workers and toilers for their ability to produce, never for what we produce. The difference in the two is what the capitalists refer to as surplus value or profit. The capitalist keeps this surplus value for himself, though he never works or produces anything. The African worker state can only come into existence by the workers destroying the colonial base of capitalist production, uh, replacing the oppressive state of the colonial capitalist and transforming surplus value into social wealth to provide for the well being of society. This is how the African worker state will provide free health care education, housing, childcare, et cetera, for the toiling masses through expropriating the stolen resources from the colonialist capitalists, destroying the system of private ownership of social production and creating a system of social ownership of social production. In a word, socialism, the early stages, the early stage of communism. This is the new world we're fighting for in this party. It's not a world to be achieved through reforming police departments or improving police community relations within the US or anywhere else. It's not something that can be achieved by $15 per hour minimum wage for workers in general over a period of years. We will have to make a revolution under the leadership of the advanced attachment of the African working class, guided by the advanced theory of African internationalism to initiate the world free from economic slavery and colonial oppression. This is why we must fight to put revolution on the political agenda for our people once again. Our recognition of the role played by imperialist parasitism in the advent of the capitalist system as a world system also gave the African People's Socialist Party an understanding of the nature of the capitalist state as distinguished from the European feudal state that preceded it. Most white socialists and many progressive, so-called progressive, recognize the state as a coercive instrument in the service of the ruling class that is necessary to protect the status quo from disruption and overthrow by exploited classes and to compete with capitalists internationally for profits at their expense. However, unlike the other states in history, the capitalist state did not come into existence for the purpose of protecting a domestic social system. It was organized to deal with the reorganization of the world's political economy that came into being as capitalism required. Uh, it was organized to deal uh, with the reorganization of the world, world's uh, political economy that, 
that came into being as capitalism required the dispossession and enslavement of Africans and much of the world previously external to Europe. The initial acts that gave birth, shape, and definition to the capitalist state was killing and controlling indigenous peoples, stealing and occupying foreign territories, and capturing, forcibly dispersing, and enslaving African people in Africa and abroad. The capitalist state rose in contention with the feudal state in Europe. In short order, it became a popular white people's state that employed enthusiastic and willing masses of white people as a form of institutionalized emergent state violence used to kill and take land from the indigenous peoples of what is now North American Australia and to enslave Africans and others worldwide. And, and what we are talking about is when you look at what happened in the United States, uh, for example, when you look at with Europe, white people ordinarily did not own land, ordinary white people, this was the landlord, this is nobility, the majority of the white people or many of them uh, were, uh, were peasants and, and serfs living on, uh, on the land uh, owned and controlled by the nobility. Uh, but they became landowners for the first time. They became landowners in the attack on the indigenous, this land of, 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 that's now called the Americas. This is what provided them land and homes and houses and things like that. And for the first time, some element of security in their lives. It was uh, uh, taking, stealing the land uh, in occupied Zion, South Africa, that they now call South Africa. This made white people landowners. In fact, Cecil Rhodes, one of the killers of thugs uh, who uh, led this uh, attack on, on Southern Africa, uh, uh, brought uh, hundreds and perhaps thousands of white people there who were willing to take up guns and kill black people to get their land. Uh, and so this is part of the whole foundation, the whole process of creating the capitalist social system. So in fact, uh, part of the much touted uh, progress of capitalism was this elevation of ordinary white people to the status of land owners on stolen land and workers in a slave developed economy. This was, and they became workers. This is the ordinary white people live under feudalism uh, who uh, were tied to the land, uh, who every part of what they produced, the landlord got it. Uh, they had no land of their own. Uh, and when the landlord sold the land, they went with it. Now, for the first time, by killing indigenous people in the Americas, by attacking Africa, uh, they can now become land owners themselves. Uh, and they can have an element of freedom that comes at the expense of the colonized peoples of the world. And this has been characterized as progress. Progress because you can see now moving from feudalism in Europe uh, to capitalism, which came at the expense of the life and freedoms of Africans and other colonized peoples around the world. So we say, uh, 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 in fact, part of the most, much touted progress of capitalism was this elevation of ordinary white people to the status of landowners on stolen land and workers in a, a slave developed economy. This was the economic incentive for white men scalping uh, indigenous people in the Americas, slaughtering indigenous people in Australia and Africa and waging an, uh, uh, an independent struggle against European feudal states to steal indigenous lands throughout South uh, America. So, uh, uh, the brutality of the capitalist state against Africans within the US and elsewhere, the viciousness of the capitalist state in subduing Africans, indigenous, uh, Asians, and other people is not an anomaly. It is inherent to the, its nature and consistent with its genesis as a state protecting a social system rooted in colonial slavery. While the capitalist state is a coercive institution, that sometimes mistreats, jails, and even shoots its European citizens who get caught in its friendly fire. Its primary purpose is the violent suppression of, of the colonized population. As African internationalists, as African internationalism has explained, white people function as part of the capitalist state. In its treatment of Africans, Mexicans, and indigenous, et cetera, its true function as a colonial state is raw and exposed. The purpose of the US state is to contain the other. The colonial pedestal, pedestal upon which all capitalist activity occurs and which benefits the entire colonizer population. This is why in its European control, in, in all European controlled countries, white citizens are generally united with efforts of the state 
to crush any form of African and colonial resistance. It is true that democracy is a form of the state. However, for the colonized, the pursuit of democracy is the struggle to limit and eliminate the intervention of the colonial state in their lives and affairs. This is why our party has raised the demand of black community control of the police, for example, uh, in the popular struggle against police murder in the US. This is why we have instituted numerous African people's tribunals to try and judge colonial aggression against our people, whether uh, for reparations or police murder. Uh, this is what helps us to understand uh, that the only way we can be free uh, is to negate the authority and power of the capitalist colonial state and to uh, provide a revolutionary movement that where African people ourselves uh, will control uh, the state. We will create our own state apparatus uh, on, on, the, on the foundation of, of uh, a destroyed a colonial capitalist state apparatus. This is where our freedom is. This is what we're about. This is what this African Liberation Day is about. Our objective is to organize African people, and especially from the poor and oppressed African working class, uh, to tie you into a, a revolutionary organization that's guided by revolutionary theory, uh, to train you uh, that the way forward is the long view, that uh, we will not be free by, just by uh, simply, uh, by only attending events or protests, but we have to have the long view to help you to understand the reality that all politic is concentrated economics and the contradict the the uh, the uh, economics uh, concentrated economics uh, uh, that we are fighting for uh, as a, as a colonized people uh, is uh, the total uh, liberation of African people and on the productive forces that uh, that we represent in Africa and globally. So this is what we're about, and this is the call for you uh, Africans to join the African Revolution, to join the party of the African Revolution, and to become uh, an agent of. Uh, for overturning this social system, to develop in the cadre, uh, to become uh, part of this whole African socialist international that's spreading, that we've spread across the globe. And where every, every place an African internationalist, a member of this party is located, uh, we have in that place, in that location, uh, we have someone who is struggling all the time uh, for the siege of political power uh, in unity with the whole African revolution and oppressed peoples around the world. So you should go to APSPUhuru.org and join the African People's Socialist Party uh, if you can unite with what has been said and what you have seen in terms of how the party expresses itself, not just in some sterile uh, concepts, abstract, abstract concepts, but the actual work we do uh, to change the world. Uh, and even as we are talking about uh, having a, 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 a revolution or having a, a socialist uh, revolution, even as we are talking about doing it, we're actually practicing being independent, practicing winning our freedom. We are preparing to govern right now. Uh, and we are preparing to govern through uh, uh, the workers, uh, African worker state that we are constructing uh, at this very moment. And hopefully your participation uh, recognizes that and will connect with this. And we're calling on everybody to join uh, this African People's Socialist Party, APSBUhuru.org. Thank you, comrades. Thank you very much, Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru, thank you, uh, Chairman O'Malley, for uh, that summation. That was a great way to bring this program to a close. Um, I, I see that my co-moderator, uh, President Yesterday, just came on screen. I don't know if you wanted to go first before I continue. I just wanted to appreciate the Chairman's summation and be on screen with you to close out the program. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to remind everybody to please continue to contribute to our work by making your donations at aldhuru.org slash donate. That's aldhuru.org slash donate. Every single penny or dollar or euro, you know, anything, whatever your currency is, counts. Um, and if you'd like what you've heard this weekend, join the African People's Socialist Party. Let us know about your interest by completing an online form at APSPUhuru.org slash join. That's APSPUhuru.org slash join. Thank you, comrades. Let's build the African Workers' State. And I'm going to pass it back to 
president yesterday, Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you so much, everyone, from yesterday and today, and absolutely all of your contributions to, you know, really completing this program. Let's forward, I think what, what the winning point is here for us is members in our organization, people who are going to support our organization, who are going to get off the sidelines and be a part of building this concrete solution to the problems that uh, colonialism has, capitalist colonialism has caused in the African community, African world by, by joining the efforts to overturn it. So thank you once again, everyone, for your viewership, for your contributions to this program. We are going, we are winning, and we are going to build the African working state in our lifetime. Uhuru.